What's happening? Welcome to the 29th episode of the Slap Stream with Georgia live from Slapsville. I just talked to Joe and we were talking about it. I can't believe that, you know, the Slap Stream lasted 29 episodes. You know, so far I found 29 bass players that I wanted to feature. And thanks to all of you that are already here. So let me read these comments. Please let me know if you can hear me fine because I'm using my portable setup here. I am in Croatia right now. So I have a bass, but it's not mine and doesn't have steel strings and all of that. So it's completely different. All right, huge shout out to Niki Lugoshi who did um, that cool video at the very beginning. And um, hello, Woody Allstar and Coffin Base. Merry Christmas to all of you and Sale. Really cool. I'm really glad that all of you guys are here. If you're not subscribed yet, please make sure to subscribe. Hit that subscribe button somewhere, somewhere around. Um, and ring the bell. Very important. Besides that, um, it's um, I just lost Joe. <laughs> Joe, come back. Uh, besides that, please uh, check out all these um, uh, support links that are below the video. Uh, we have we have um, uh, PayPal and we have Venmo under the video, and we also have uh, Patreon. So please check out. Please check out Patreon. Patreon is the main way how I'm able to do these slap streams. So if you want to see the slap streams, slap streams going on for a long time, please uh, check out the Patreon. And I offer some pretty cool perks over there. Hey, Marshall, uh, loud and clear in Virginia. I'm glad to hear that. And hello, Vlad. And hey, Lori. Um, all right, so it seems that every, everybody every, everybody can hear me fine. So as long as I can hear uh, Joe, that's going to be great. The Canadian Canadians watching from Hamilton, Ontario, love Joe Fick. Saw him on our honeymoon in Nashville. We all love Joe Fick. Um, before we start, I would like to give a shout out to the new Patreons. That's um, not just to the new ones, also to the old ones as well. Uh, Dan Rondeau, Jose Arana, Etienne Rousse, Mikey, Paul Moonmo, Eva Lee, Richard Trails, Scott Owen, Bob Collin, Dave Tugboat, Kurt Treeback. Thanks a lot for supporting the Slap Stream. If you want to hear, uh, if you want to, if you want to see these episodes. If you want to hear your name on it, make sure to go to the Patreon. All right, Joe is here, and it seems that everything is ready. So, hey, Joe, what's happening? Hey, George A. How are you? I'm good. I'm having a hard time hearing you right now. Um, we had it perfect for the last hour, and now uh, it's uh, you sound robotic again, but... Uh, it's good to be here in Slapsville. Yeah, it seems that everybody can hear us, you know. So, um, so I think that's more the most important. As long as all the viewers can see us, we can suffer for the higher cause of slap bass. Um, first of all, I want to ask you, like, uh, how how are things in Nashville now? I heard about that crazy bomb attack uh, in a van last yesterday. So I can't, uh, I can't you see you me? right now on your screen. Okay. Um, all right. I would like to ask the audience, can you see me? Can you see Joe? Uh, and let me know what is the issue and if you can hear us and if you can see us. Okay. And in yeah, the meantime, I'm going to say hey to Tommy. Greetings from Finland. These always start at a good time, 9 p.m. local time. 
Uh, after the sauna, you can just relax and learn all evening by watching the slap stream. Happy holidays. All right, so it seems that everyone can hear us fine. See, Vlad says that, Carolyn, Stefan, Nikki, Les. I can see you now. And All right, so good. So everybody can hear us, everybody can see us, so we can start. I wanted to ask you about that um, terrible Nashville van attack. What happened yesterday? That's for I can't hear you. What what happened we'll yesterday with that with that uh, uh, bomb attack in Nashville yesterday? Say that again. All right. Can you hear me now? You know what? I'll I'll text you so you can you can uh, you can also read read that. Um, what happened with uh, that Nashville bomb attack yesterday? Sorry, guys. It seems that Joe has a little bit of a technical problems over there. So hopefully he's going to be back soon because I have this cool flyer. For Joe Fick, let's see. I see that he's trying to be back, but I'm not sure if you guys are aware. And if you Google it, uh, there was like, um, we don't know yet what happened, but there was an, a, a bomb attack in Nashville and then you know, everyone lost internet. So we almost uh, didn't have a chance to do this. So Joe is using his phone. So hopefully, uh, hopefully it's going to work now. I wanted to ask you about this uh, um, bomb uh, van attack that happened yesterday in Nashville. Are you guys okay? Right. Right. We're okay. Um, yeah, we woke up to it yesterday morning. There was a like an RV um, that was detonated on 2nd Avenue, which is about... Um, it's about two blocks from where I normally play. I play right up the block, uh, on Robert's Western World. And uh, anyway, nobody was uh, nobody was was killed, but um, uh, hurt, and a bunch of buildings were were destroyed. And um, anyway, uh, I'll be off all weekend. They're, they pretty much have shut all of downtown down. But um, you know, we're just fortunate that everyone's safe. It's Obviously, it's knocked out our internet, and that's why we're having problems right now. I, I uh, texted you yesterday about it, saying, I don't know if we're going to be able to do the slap stream. It's really hard picking up Wi-Fi and internet. So we're going to do the best we can today. Yes, you know, like everybody, is, everybody understands that, you know, we have great audience here. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody is a bass player, but everybody loves bass, which is, you know, huge plus. <laughs> Um, besides that, you know, hopefully, you know, that's not going to happen again. Um, but how have you been holding up during the, the pandemic and this whole end of the world thing? Right. Well, um, honestly, when it, when it all first happened back in March, you know, I was, I was working for so many years downtown that, you know, the, the break was kind of nice, honestly. But, you know, a couple, three weeks went by and it was, you know, it was like, well, okay, I think it's time to, and, you know, initially they told us, oh, it'll probably be just two weeks or whatever. And then they were saying, oh, it's probably going to be May. And then they're going to say, oh, it's probably going to be June. And um, so that was, that, that was, um, that was a little unnerving and uh, just not knowing when we we're going to go back to work. You know, um, anybody that knows me knows I, I, I play a lot here in town. I, play five nights a week at Robert's Western world and I have a couple of other gigs on lower broadways. So it was, um, it was really strange to get out of my routine that I've been in for so long. Um, my, uh, my in-laws are, are actually bluegrass musicians. And so I was, we, we all kind of locked down together and would travel between Nashville and Kentucky just to keep it interesting. And so I got a chance to play some bluegrass with my family, which is great. My father-in-law used to play, for Ralph Stanley and uh, my brother-in-law plays for the Grascals. So I, I was in good company with uh, keeping my chops up. 
but uh, we've uh, right. we've yeah. gone back to work several times. Um, we we went back to work in June. Things were open, and then they shut us back down. And then as as of September, the clubs opened back up, but there were a lot of restrictions. Um, you know, you can only have a certain amount of people. can with it right now so now you're not not able to play again for i guess for a week or two because of this this accident yesterday say that again i could i you're, it's once again it kind of sounds robotic you were texting me those questions that actually that actually helps so ah okay um so are you are you going to be able to work soon again or this is going to the Roberts going to close like for 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 a while So I can't hear you and I don't see you on the screen right now um okay you know since I wrote most of these questions I'm going to I'm going to start texting you Sorry okay. guys <laughs> uh so we're going to get to this um oh we lost joe again all right hopefully this is not going to happen but i hope you guys understand because you know we if, if, if we're not able to do this we're going to do it again because i really wanted to have joe thick um as a guest for a long time but you know things are unpredictable especially we you know with attacks like this the day after Christmas, crazy. Um, all right, hopefully he's, I mean, I see that he's trying to come back and we talked like for, you know, almost two hours before the show. Let's see. He even showed me one cool lick that I didn't know before. I was excited to show it to you as well. Let's see. Thank you, Woody. I'm glad you guys understand. But you can use this time to subscribe if you haven't subscribed. If you're not on our email list, send an email to contact at artofslabbase.com and then you'll be the first one to know when um, these shows are happening again. Hopefully every Saturday or a while. Thank you, Antia. We don't care. We just love you guys. We're patient. We love you too. Yeah, Nikki, it's, that's the magic of being live. Anything can happen. Carolyn. Let's see. All right. I see Joe is really trying to get in. Um, All right, he's here. How it is now? I can't see can anything right me? now. As long as you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm asking you, uh, are you not going to be able to work for a while now? Am I out of work for a while? Are you going to be able to work soon again? You not going. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, it keeps it keeps kicking me off, so I, I apologize. Um, there we go. Sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how long we'll be out of work. We've we've um, we've worked through this whole fall. We started in September, and things kind of picked back up. But a lot of the a lot of the bars and clubs downtown right now can only really afford to be open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. Maybe a Sunday night. Um, they've restricted regulations you have to have a certain you can only have a certain amount of people and so um 
we're just kind of doing the best we can right now. Um, you know, I work three, four days a week and that's pretty good considering, you know, what I see on social media, Facebook, a lot of people just say they haven't played music in, in months. So, you know, I feel pretty fortunate really. Um, but um, as for this latest thing in Nashville, I don't, I'm, I'm assuming we'll go back to work next week, but uh, we, we don't know. We'll find out. Yeah. Hopefully it's going to, they're going to, they're going to solve the, all the problems, you know, soon, I right. guess. I mean, not pandemic problems. I mean, those as well, but like I'm, I'm talking about uh, the, the attack that happening that happened yesterday. I mean, two days ago, is it two days ago or yesterday? Uh, yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday. Okay. Any damage uh, to Roberts? Uh, one more time. Uh, any damage to the club that you play, Roberts? <laughs> I can't. I can't hear. It's a, their voice is so robotic right now. It's kind of like earlier on in, uh, when we when we called each other. Can you text me the question? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. This never happens. <laughs> uh, no, no, not at Roberts. No, um, Roberts is about two blocks away. So. Um, Roberts is the place, like a legendary place on in Nashville, where all great musicians play. If you guys are not familiar, since I know that we have audience from all over the world, and Joe is one of the guys. Each other, and and so Second Avenue was was what what suffered the most, and um, and Roberts is okay, but because they have to do an investigation downtown, they're closing pretty much everything on Broadway down. So. Uh, have you done any uh, online shows uh, since the pandemic started? Just waiting for, there we go. Have you done any online? Okay, yeah, I did. Um, I did, we did a couple back in April. Um, and um, let's see, we've kind of live streamed from some of the, some of the gigs that, that we, that are open right now. Um, we work for mostly for tips. So um, if we if we have sort of, uh, you know, if the, the numbers are few um, and we sort of maybe, you know, set up the iPhone and, and go live and uh, a lot of people will Venmo us tips and and uh, which is really nice. So, yeah, it kind of keeps it kind of keeps a small band like us afloat. So. Uh, OK, let's start with your beginnings. Um, when and how did you start playing music? All right, guys, you know, I'm glad that you understand what's going on and the numbers are not going down. You all are very patient. Really appreciate it. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. Did, when when did I start playing music? Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, well, uh, okay. Actually, yeah. I start. I started when I was um, about five years old. I start on the violin. My older uh, brother and sister um, played violin and viola, and so we, our family was sort of a symphonic orchestral family. I, I got tagged, or you know. Uh, basically got dragged along to a lot of orchestra concerts for my older brother and sister. So I kind of grew up around that. And um, so I played violin for, from the time I was about five to maybe seven or eight, did the Suzuki method. And then I took a year and, and I hated that. <laughs> um, and then I started playing cello when I was 10. I did that all the way up um, It's happening again. Well, it's 2020. So I'm surprised I was able to do, you know, almost 30 episodes perfectly, but it's the one. Upright days when I was about 16. And um, basically uh, me and my two buddies kind of started a 50s rock, rock and roll rockabilly band. And um, we were, we used to play the T Tacoma Farmer's Market every summer. And um, 
we were just three acoustic guitars and um basically uh you know we you know we wanted to be able to set up as a full band but you're playing outside so you're playing acoustically we saw a bluegrass band at that same farmer's market and they had an upright bass and i was like oh that would be that would be perfect that would be the way to you know we could all we could play the bass two guitars or or even a small drum set with brushes so i, I basically begged my mom to um you know let's go get an upright bass we, we called around and there you are i see you now we called around and um um we found a bass shop in uh, just a little bit uh, south of seattle i'm from tacoma washington and um the bass shop was just south of the airport at a little place called hammond ashley in, in des moines washington and um so my mom took me there and it's this little old shop out in the middle of the woods. And um, basically when I got there, uh, the guy that owned the place, he took me out into this warehouse and he just said, have at it. It was like hundreds of bases just all over the place. And so I picked out a, uh, I think it was the third base I, I picked out. It was a, a 39K. I didn't realize it was a 39K until this year. I actually looked, looked up the serial number, but so we, we rented that base um, and then it was kind of a rent to own thing. And I was off and running. It was set up with, you know, spiral cores and the action was way too high and it had a rosewood fingerboard on it. I had no idea what I was doing, but uh, that was, this is basically how I got started. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to be able to play acoustically in a lot of situations because at the time we were so young that the only kind of places we could play were coffee shops and, um, uh, you know, farmer's markets, things like that. So. Did you hear any of that? And that was all with that was all with Dempsey's. Was Dempsey's your first band? Yes, yes, that was that was the first band. Um, it was Brad Burke at all, uh, and a guy named Mike Moffat. And um, we basically kind of was like a lot of three part harmony stuff, and we were kind of obsessed with El early Elvis and Dion and the Belmonts and um, Chuck Berry and. Um, so that was kind of the first incarnation of the band. And then, um, we graduated high school and our drummer, he went to college and, um, a buddy of ours, Ron Perone joined the band. Um, and so he joined in, in like 94, like December of 94 and the band broke up in December of 2009. So we had like a 15 year run, just the same three guys, which, you know, when you're in your twenties, it's, that's, uh. It's almost impossible to keep together, but but yeah, that was the Dempsey's. Do you still play with those guys? Uh, well, we've been threatening it. Um, they live in Memphis, and I live in Nashville, so it's um, it's it's kind of hard to coordinate. We we got together a couple of summers ago um, and uh, tried to revisit the old stuff. Uh, our, our drummer Ron hadn't, played, so he was kind of trying to figure it all out and. And I hadn't played that fast in in years, so it was like we were all looking at each other, going, "God, do we really want to do this? Can we? Can we do this?" So it's been since uh, I think the last show we did was was December of two thousand nine. Oh, really? Oh, wow! So you guys haven't played for ten years? Mm. Okay, so you haven't played for 10 years. <laughs> um, do, uh, uh, do you still play uh, these other instruments that you, you mentioned? And uh, guys, just so you know, uh, I'm texting Joe all these questions as well uh, so that he can... Yeah, do Uh, do you still play violin and cello? Oh, no, I don't. <clears throat> no, um, I pretty much, violin I stopped when I was very young, and the cello, I pretty much, after I graduated high school, uh, that was that. But my sister, actually, her daughter, who's six, plays a violin and, and has my old violin. Um, that I had when I was a kid and I talked to her yesterday on Christmas and she said that her daughter just got a brand new violin so she's going to send me uh, my violin from the early 80s or whenever that was that I had it. 
but just like knowing to play these instruments, uh, was that helpful for your when you were when you started learning to play bass? I think so. Yeah, I mean, it definitely it definitely gave me a working of the left hand uh, with the cello when it made switch to the bass. Of course, for a couple of years, I was playing both bass and cello. I play bass mostly in the summertime when I was when we would do those uh, farmers markets gigs, and we always seem to have a lot of gigs in the summertime. And then when school would would get would uh, come back in session, I would I would you know get with my cello, and everything seemed so tiny. And uh, so I would say for the left hand, yes. I mean, even though we are you know in bass, technically we're not supposed to use our third finger. Um, it kind of gave me a, 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 the, this kind of feel. But do you use the third finger when you play? Sometimes, yeah. I've caught myself doing it. And, and I know from this uh, snap stream that... Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. How did I get interested in slap bass? How did you get interested in slap bass, yes. Okay, I'm going on your last text that you sent me. So uh, how did I get interested in slap bass? Well, I think it kind of grew out of the... I know initially when we started the Dempsey's, it, I wasn't really slapping the bass, and I wasn't even really aware that that was the sound on a lot of the early Elvis records um, until um, my buddy Brad showed me um, clips of, of, of like Elvis on the Ed Sullivan show and the Dorsey Brothers and stage show. And then I realized what Bill Black, Bill Black was creating that, that sound with his right hand. So by the time, I, I guess by the time I got into college, I, I, uh, I had this uh, Sun Records box set and it was like a three, three CD box set. And it was, it was basically the first one was a blues, a blues set, which is like Howlin' Wolf, James Cotton, B.B. King. The second one was the Elvis, Carl Perkins, Johnny Cash, Billy Lee Riley. And then the third disc was sort of the late period, more rock and roll sun stuff. So I was obsessed with the second disc, which, you know, had all of the the Bill Black recordings, you know, or the Elvis recordings with Bill Black, and the Johnny Cash recordings with Marshall Grant. So that started it, and then of course uh, Stray Cats, which I'm wearing my Stray Cat shirt today, um, was a huge Lee Rocker fan. Um, George, I think you and I talked about this. We both had we both had uh, copies of Rock Tokyo that um, Stray Cat video that was recorded in the early early '90s as like a video cassette. And so that was, that was about as instructional videos you could get on, on how to figure out how to play this stuff. So yeah, I'd say like it's a combination of kind of the original Rockabilly records and then um, the Stray Cats. Uh, do you remember the, the first lick that you learned on bass and slap bass? Uh, yeah, you want me to show it to you? <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> Something real simple. I think, you know, what I what I mostly learned when I first started playing was was, you know. Okay, I did that on a lot of songs. And then we started to get into a little bit more of the the country stuff and I think it was maybe the song Hello Mary Lou, Ricky Nelson, and you know that's got more of a that more of a, more of a bass line. And so to keep my timing right, I, I would I would add just a just a like a double slap in between. So a you know, so that and that was about the extent of um of that was about the extent of my playing for the first couple of years. Uh I would like to hear you play now something. You know, do you actually? It's um, it's pretty late here in Croatia. Uh, can you show me that lick that we were talking about? Yeah, you want to do that? Yes, let's do that. So, so I have to explain uh, to our audience since I'm in Croatia and now it's um, pretty late in the evening and I cannot play. I'm in the apartment building, so I can't play really too loud. So we're going to do the lesson uh, section of the slap stream now. So I don't want you to miss out on the lesson with Joe Thick. 
and me neither. So grab grab your bases and um, let's learn something today. All right, what key is the 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 lick in? I had you perfect for a minute there as soon as I picked up my bass and now, now it's frozen again. So we might have uh, via text again. I'm sorry. All right. That's, uh... <laughs> I have to ask him about those dots. Thanks for pointing out, Woody All-Star. Uh, so... So I just asked Joe. What... All right. Okay. So yeah, the key, the um, the song is um, in the key of G, and I, I, it's not so much a song as just kind of a chord progression. I, I told George a that it's sort of like um, uh, Blue Moon. You know, it'd be like Blue Moon of Kentucky. So we have. Okay, so the, the the lick that we were talking about, it's sort of a, um, I call it a like a rolling arpeggio. So basically, I'll play I'll play the whole thing through, and then we can kind of dissect it a little bit. So and it's uh, you're gonna need to, in order to play this, you'll need the uh, you don't necessarily need it, but it helps that uh, that quadruple uh, Nikolai D. Boucher thing that I picked up on uh, on YouTube. So it goes like this. Okay, and so one more time, I'll do it slowly. That sounds great. Uh, a, a question, uh, is it possible for you to uh, show it to us section by section? I kind of hear four different sections. So if you can yeah, start section. with the first one. Sure, absolutely. Okay, so the first chord is G, obviously. And um, so what I like to do and in, when, I, when I take a solo, this is just one, one kind of deal I do. It's just like I break up the arpeggio. So I like to use one, threes, and fives. Okay, so basically we're going to go... Okay, so that's G, wait. Okay, so G, B, open G, open D, B, okay? So it's gonna be, so really slow, it's gonna go. Okay, so, so pick string, roll, and if you don't do the, if you don't do the uh, quadruplet like this, you can do the, the drag triplet, so you can go. Okay, so uh, either way it works. Okay, so that's the first one. All right, let me try to repeat it. So you said it's a G, B, G, D, B, right? G, B, open G, open D, B. <clears throat> All right. And I will try with those uh, roll slabs. Um, but the one that you're, you're doing is uh, probably the, uh, the one that Nicola was showing, right? Um, it doesn't seem that Joe can hear me, but I believe that's it. And I usually do quadruple says, but this, oh, Joe is gone again. All right, so I'll try to do the pattern um, as close as possible to him, but I'll do it with those rolls the way I usually do it. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Am I close? That's very close. That's it. That's All it. right, let's do the it. second section. You want to do the next section? Yes. Okay. So the next section is the is the four chord, um, just to, which is basically just a a C chord. Um, I'm starting on the on the five of the C chord, so that's going to be a G. Let's see. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. G, E on the uh, D string, C, kind of an octave there, so, okay, did you get that? Let's see, so the notes are G, E, C, G, C, and I have to mention yes. that I'm playing this uh, gut string bass. Uh, which I never play. I prefer my steel strings, but it is what it is. It's the only bass that I have in Croatia. So, um, uh, all right, let me try both. Is the, the section, second section good? Yeah, that, that sounded right. Let me hear it. Let me hear it one more time. Sorry, it, it's kind of breaking up. Okay. Right. Is that what you're doing? It, it's uh, it kind of sounds metallic on this end, but I think rhythm right, sounds right. Both uh, well, both uh, both sections, so which I recommend to our viewers as well. <laughs> I think string must be lower because you play. I know, yes. Uh, uh, Joel plays much lower sec, uh, much lower setup than I do. And now I play gut strings, but it's even higher uh, than I what I usually do with my steel strings. But for me, I mean, this is not my ideal setup, but it's still, I mean, as I said, it's what I have. I have to make it work. Um, before he shows up, I'm just going to practice these first two lines, which I recommend you to do as well. And the second one is... Uh, all right, I think I got it. Now we're just waiting for Joe for the third line and the fourth line. Sorry for all of these, but it's completely understandable. If you guys missed the very beginning, there was a, an attack in Nashville, and all Nashville is out of uh, internet. So uh, it's actually huge luck that we have that we are able to have Joe present at all. So I think we're ready for the for the third line. Let me play the first and second line real quick for you. Okay, that sounds good. Let's do the third line. Okay, third line. Here we go. So let me war let me get to the third line here. So okay. okay, so D, G, and B. And then G, B, G. And where are you putting those roll slaps? Oh, God, I can hear you perfect right now. Don't move. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Where are you uh, putting those roll slaps? Roll, okay, the roll slaps, right. So uh, uh, good question. Here we go. The roll slap would go on the G. So the, you're gonna, the, the D is the first note. 
or <coughs> however you want to do it. Drag triplet or, or the roll. Okay. So, and then the second part of the th third line. Oh, right. Um, that would be a G, B, G, open G again. And where are you putting the roll? You're breaking up a little bit on my end. So uh, at a first, I realize that you're playing this. And then the second line, I'm not sure if you're playing or you're playing. Where are you putting the roll slap? Before G or before right. B? I lost you again. I can hear you. I can okay. hear you. Okay. Uh, where are you putting the roll slap in the second part of the third line? You want me to hear it again? Uh -huh, okay. Right? I think so. I think I, I think I got it. All right. All right. And what is the last line? Last line is uh, okay. Let me get to it. Sorry. We gotta do it in context. So, I think I think I got the last one is the one that is based on rumba. I call it double rumba. So, okay. So let's see. Joe is back. Um, so the. I believe that you said that the fourth line is this. One, one more time. Yes. All right, let me try the whole thing now. Ah. Uh, I think that's it. So it, it's, it, it's close, right? It, it sounds good. Yes, it sounds just like it. Okay. I can't see you. I think I have to practice. I... I'll try it one more time to see if I can get it better. <laughs> This, the, the third line is confusing. Okay. That's it. All right. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> all right. I hope you guys are better than I did. A little bit hard, like with this uh, this connection, but I think, and it's late in Croatia, so I'm gonna stop playing and let Joe play um, as soon as he come back. <laughs> as soon as he comes back. Uh, all right, you guys are still here. Thanks so much. You guys are slapdastic. And Cloudberry's heel here. Hi, Cloudberry. And Nikki also said hi to you. Um, are we on, Joe? Are we on? In the meantime, we have uh, super stickers and super chat available. And it's right under the live chat. So if you want your comment to be featured for a longer period of time, that's the way to go. That's the way to support us, what we're doing. 
Um, all right, Joe is not back. Okay, so did anyone else try to, to play the line? I hope you did. I hope you got it right. It's pretty cool. I like the way Joe plays and um, uh, and and combines these notes from the arpeggio. Arpeggio is like not in a, in a, in a common way, like in a in a section when he goes like to four, which is C E G. He starts with uh, with G and goes to E, and um, I think it's really cool. A uh, question is from Woody. Are you going to be playing while I'm in Croatia? I'm not going to be playing. It's There's no live music going on. Uh, all right, Joe is back. Welcome back to Slapsville. <laughs> Hope you can hear me. <laughs> um, it's, it's a unique slap stream. So, and everybody's still here. So, um, you know, we have the best people out here. And I'm not sure. Can you hear me now or should I just continue texting you the questions? Is it okay to put the bass down? All right. That's fine. Okay. Um, uh, besides, uh, so, so, so somebody asked, like, how did you get the name uh, Dempsey's? All right, I'm texting him, so it's hopefully he's okay, gonna thanks. be able to answer. And also, if you have any questions, like please write them down so so that I can ask him, like in these periods of time when he, we can actually hear him. Um, maybe I should, I should just edit this interview later on and have it and post it without all these embarrassing moments of me talking and trying to entertain you and keep you here. Come on, Joe, come back, come back, please come back. Um, in the meantime, you can also tell me and ask me if you have any questions uh, regarding Slab base or anything really that I'm able to answer. Oh, hey, Tattoo, you said that you have lucky neighbors, they can hear some cool bass slapping. I'm not sure if all my neighbors uh, share your enthusiasm about bass slapping. You know, I've been practicing bass for a long time, and then even when I was practicing with the bow, um, I don't think that my neighbors were that happy. You're back. Are you trying to find a better spot? Here's to you, Stefan, as well. Trying a different room. Can you hear me at all? All right. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Can you, you ask me? about how we got the name that? How we got the name the Dempseys? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, the name the Dempseys. That's uh, that's the name of our eighth grade English teacher, Howard Dempsey, who I believe is still alive. And I know he's not teaching anymore, but we all had him as a teacher, and uh, we would do impressions of him. And uh, one of our friends just jokingly said one time, "Oh, you guys should call your band the Dempseys." So. You know, that's how that's how it, that's how the name stuck. I mean, it was just sort of a fluke. It wasn't wasn't anything that we planned on. Does he know that you named yes. the pants after him? Yes, he does. Yes, he's proud of it. Did yeah. he ever come to any show? Nope. <laughs> all right. So you you can hear me now. I don't have to, to type all the questions, right? Seems a little better. Um, I would like to ask you about, uh, so while you were in Memphis, besides the Dem Dempses, 
you played with lots of people from the 50s. How was that experience? Who did I play with from the 50s when I was in Memphis? Yes. Well, um, initially, the, the way the Dempsey's got from Tacoma, Washington to Memphis was um, it was actually through a, uh, uh, a Carl Perkins show that took place in um, at the Cook Convention Center in Memphis in 1996. And um, uh, Brad Burkadall, our guitar player, the Dempsey's, he was part of this Elvis Presley fan club. And... Um, uh basically he sent a demo tape do you remember those demo tapes <laughs> and uh he basically sent this demo tape to this fan club out of chicago it was an elvis presley fan club that um they they basically every year during elvis week which is in august they met in memphis and um so the the president of the fan club he, he liked our demo tape it had a i think it had a version of baby let's play house blue moon of kentucky blue moon i think and um, maybe one other tune. It was just four songs we sent to him. We just said, hey, you know, we're we're like, you know, we're these young guys. We love Elvis. We're not impersonators, but we we love, you know, we love playing. You know, we're basically, we like to do the Scotty Bill Elvis thing, you know. And so through that, he said, look, there's this big show coming up in, um, in August 96, and I want you guys to open for Carl Perkins. It's an Elvis tribute show. So DJ Fontana will be on the on the bill. And um, a couple of other a couple of other names. I think maybe the Jordanaires might have been there. So we saved up our money and we <clears throat> uh, flew down to Memphis. We flew the upright base down. That's back back in the 90s when you can actually do that. You could get a big flight case and um, pay, you know, 50 bucks and, and ship it one way and pay 50 bucks and ship it back the other underneath the airplane. So we we went to Memphis and we open for Carl Perkins. We met him. It was amazing. Um, he was a huge man. And uh, his show was awesome. He he did this whole thing about how how uh, when he when he played live, he did this whole thing about how, you know, <clears throat> how he wrote Blue Suede Shoes, but really by Elvis doing the, the song Blue Suede Shoes really put him over the top. And there was never any any animosity about it. Um, and he was just uh, well, we, and we were, and we gave him a copy of our uh, our demo tape. We're like, hey, listen to this. I don't know if he ever did, but um, it was just cool to do that. Um, so anyway, we opened for Carl Perkins, and that kind of opened up the door for us to continue to do more Elvis events in Memphis. So about, I guess, about maybe six months later, we we flew down for another event that was uh, that had Scotty and DJ involved, and that was really cool. That was back when Ronnie McDowell was doing a lot of um, Ronnie McDowell was doing a lot of shows with, I guess he'd call it all the King's men. It was the Jordan airs and it was Scotty and DJ and, and they would do all the, all the early hits. And, you know, Scotty was just getting his chops back after being, you know, kind of retired for a really long time. So <clears throat> it was really cool to meet those guys and, you know, to sort of hear that stuff played not on a record, but, but played live, you know, um, and so it was it was shortly after it was shortly after we started doing those shows that they opened up a theme nightclub on Beale Street called Elvis Presley's Memphis. They opened up in, in July of 97. And um, that was kind of back when there were a lot of uh, themed nightclubs. There was the Hard Rock Cafe and there was Planet Hollywood. Well, Elvis Presley Enterprises wanted to do their kind of spin on that, which would be, you know, would be a really kind of a more upscale nightclub. But but uh, in it, you had like you had like cases where his jumpsuits would be like, you know, on display and they had, uh, they had a screen that would come down behind the stage. It would play, uh, Elvis movies or, and you know, you could order a fried, uh, let's see, a fried peanut butter and banana sandwich. So anyway, we, we did the grand opening of that nightclub in July of 97. And shortly after that, we were, we were asked to, to basically kind of become their, their, house band if you will i mean we weren't there every night but we were probably there like three nights a week so we the me brad and and ron we all moved to uh um memphis and uh, became kind of the house band down there now one one story i'll share with you real quick i know you want me to keep talking so 
Paul Burleson kind of enters into the mix here. Um, I didn't I didn't go initially to Memphis because I thought, well, I think I should probably stay in college. You know, I, I don't know what I was thinking. But um, so those guys went to Memphis. They got another bass player. And I, I was kind of kicking myself for not going. Um, and then about two months later, I get a call from Rocky Burnett, Johnny Burnett's son, saying, hey, look, our uh, our, our rhythm section just got deported. They're, they're, these guys were from the Netherlands, I believe. And um, uh, basically he said, look, we need a bass player. We're going to find a drummer. He's like, you came highly recommended. So I went on the road with Paul Burleson for six weeks and the, the gig started in Las Vegas. We went down through San Diego, played with Lee Rocker. I met the guys from PR549 that night. They were on, on the road. It was so cool. I met uh, Kim Lenz and Jake Irwin was playing bass for her at the time. And we went up the West Coast and did some shows with them. I went, then we went down through Colorado and we played with the Hillbilly Hellcat. So I got to see Lance Bakemeyer, Lance Romance play bass, which blew my mind. And then we went to over through Kansas City and St. Louis. And one of our last gigs was seeing the legendary Shack Shakers in Columbus, Ohio. And that whole show blew my mind. And then the very last, I flew out of Memphis. So I met up with the guys from the Dempsey's and they said, look, this, our bass player's not working out. You, you got it. You got to come back. And by that time I had six weeks of being on the road with Paul Burleson. And of course, a year prior to that meeting, Scotty and DJ and Carl Perkins. And I was like, absolutely. So I flew back home to Seattle and I got all my stuff. I quit college and I moved to Memphis and the rest is history. Uh, you mentioned uh, DJ Fontana and, and Scotty Moore. Uh, have you yes. played with those guys as well? Okay, so I played, I've played on the same bill as them um, a handful of times. One time I actually did get to play with them. Um, it was, and I, I, I wanna get this right. I think it was, I think it was in Jackson, Tennessee at, um, it was like a Carl Perkins Civic Center or something like that. It was a tribute, a tribute show or something. And it was, I think it was Stan Perkins fronting the band, um, who was Carl's son. And it was DJ and then Scotty. And they asked me to play bass for, I think it was for maybe two songs. I think it was like maybe Blue Suede Shoes and shoot, I can't even remember the other one. But yeah, no, I did. One time I got to share the stage with those guys. It was it was really cool. DJ, on the on the other hand, um, we did some some of those virtual Elvis shows. Um, they had one in 2002. They had one in 07. And then they had one in 2012. And that's where they they get basically all the existing members of Elvis's, all of his bands. So the, the Blue Moon Boys, some of the guys that cut the records in the 60s. And then the TCB band from the 70s, and they, they put a whole show together um, where um, they put Elvis on the screen. And, and he's actually, they're taking his actual vocal, and we are playing along to it. So we did, me and Brad Burke at all from the Dempsey's, and then DJ, we did the 50s segment, which was like five songs. They took a lot of clips from Elvis uh, on um, Ed Sullivan. I think they did the, uh, might have been the Don't Be Cruel one where he was, uh, film from the waist up and um i think one of the stage show ones maybe shake rattle and roll anyway uh dj wore he wore headphones and um he had a click track so he could play along and and, and make sure that it was all in time with elvis's vocal because we're actually using elvis's real vocal and um so we did that three times over over like a 10-year period and it, it was just so cool i mean our, our part was really easy i think what i liked the most was watching his TCB band was like James Burton and Ronnie Tut and Jerry Chef. Those guys get up there and I mean they played like an hour and they they did all that Aloha from Hawaii stuff and Elvis on tour and it was it was really awesome, really awesome to be a part of it. And so you played with uh, DJ and Scotty at the same time, like they were playing together with you. Yeah, at one, at one time that would have been that show in Jackson. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I played in Scotty Moore's band and I played with DJ, but Sonny Burgess was singing. So I never played with 
both of them together, but you know, that might have been really cool. Um, and who was playing bass like for that uh, TCP band? Unfortunately, I didn't hear any of that. I'm, I heard DJ and I, I think you were trying to tell me that you played with him at the Ponderosa Stomp, is that right? We talked about that earlier, I know that. Who was the bass player? Oh, who's okay? <laughs> um, uh, that would be Jerry Chef, and then I think he retired because I feel like the last show we did with them in 2012, I, I feel like it was Norbert Putnam. Um, if I if I remember correctly, I know he played on a on a ton of the uh, recordings, but he wasn't really a live guy. Uh, so Bob Moore was not on it. I guess so. I, now he was not on that show, but I have seen I have seen Bob Moore. Um, he was on one Elvis. It was more of a symphonic Elvis thing that was that was at the as it was at the convention center. And um, I, what I do remember it was really cool about that was that Bob Moore he didn't play he played his upright bass. He didn't play through an amp though. He insisted on being mic'd. And so, and, and, and somehow it worked. I mean, there was a full band on stage and uh, full band, I mean, maybe four or five guys, not an orchestra, but, um, <clears throat> but it worked. And, and his, I mean, you know, his attack is unlike any other, I mean, there's, that's the reason he's on 20,000 recordings, you know, over the last 50 years, but yeah, no, it was really, it, it was cool. And I've met Bob Moore a couple of times and uh, you know, I, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that the first time I met him, I had no idea the body of work um, that he played on. I, I met him about 20 years ago at that club I played at. And I just thought he was the guy that played on U.S. Mail. Well, U.S. Mail is it's really cool. I think that's the only uh, slap bass solo that Bob Moore played. Um, that anyone actually played with 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 Elvis, so I like U U.S. Mail. Uh, it seems that you were really successful with the Dempseys. Like, why did you stop playing with them, and when? Why and when did you stop playing with the Dempseys? Um, well, I would say that to keep a band together. Well, you know, we were. I always kind of. I was kind of viewed us as like just like your typical blue collar musicians, the guys that just, you know, I don't think we ever had any, I don't think we had, ever had any dreams of trying to be famous as much as just trying to work. I think that we could make a living doing this. Um, maybe, maybe that was the, the blessing and the curse because it was, you, you could make a living doing this, but you had to really work hard. And so we literally from about 1998, when we got to Memphis to about 2009, we, we really did never stopped. We played five nights a week, sometimes six. We traveled and we would maybe take one week off a year. But, you know, we were, you know, we were paying rent, paying mortgages. People started to have kids and it was, it was, you know, you really had to, you, there were no vacations, you know, like we, I mean, we weren't making a ton of money, but we were making enough to you know, make a CD every now and then or, or, or buy a touring van or whatever. So, you know, by the time, by the time we were 15 years into it, I think we were, you know, we started it when we were about 17 and by the time we were in our early thirties, I think maybe everybody's uh, uh, ideas about music had changed a little bit and some people wanted to go one direction. Some people wanted to go another. It wasn't really, there weren't really no hard feelings. It was just, um, it was just, oh, maybe it's time for a change. And so when it when it kind of finally did end, it was, you know, it was kind of a bit of a relief, relief to it. Like, oh, man, now maybe we can, everybody can kind of do their own thing. But, you know, you kind of wonder that, you kind of wonder sometimes, well, maybe if we would have just taken a vacation, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe we'd taken a month off, which is like something we never did. You know, we were just work, 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 work. So I think there's something to be said for taking a break, which is why, you know, earlier when you asked me about the pandemic, um, you know, it was kind of a, like a horrible, it was a horrible relief. Like I, I get that phrase from that Eagles documentary where they say the band breaking up was a horrible re relief. Well, I can understand that because it's like, you work so hard, 
and uh, sometimes you just need a break, so a long break. Um, right after you quit the, the 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 band, you you basically moved to Nashville. Why did you decide to move to Nashville and not to stay in Memphis? Right, that's a good question. I I think. I think what Nashville for me was, was, um, you know, Nashville has a certain sound and, you know, the Dempsey's even, we started to kind of, we started to kind of get into that sound. We, you know, like when we first got to Memphis, we were just kind of a straight up rockabilly, you know, Stray Cats, Elvis, all that kind of stuff. I think, and I think the more we would go up to Nashville and see what was kind of happening up there, we would, you know, I remember my guitar player switching from a, from a big giant Gretsch to a, a Fender Telecaster, you know, he, he was kind of getting into the, the chicken picking thing. And we were all kind of getting into the more of the honky tonk thing and more of the country music thing. And, and really kind of trying to straddle both, both cities, you know, both cities have such a different vibe and yet they're so close to each other. They're only about three hours apart from each other. Um, you know, Memphis is the blues and Memphis is rockabilly and soul and Nashville is country music. So to me, I always, I always loved the sound of going down to Lower Broadway and, and hearing a hot Telecaster player and someone sing a Johnny Horton song or, or you know, a Hank Williams song. And so I kind of always knew that, that if the Dempsey's, if, we, if it didn't work out in Memphis, I, I, I was so close to Nashville that I thought it was a good, it was a, it would be a good option for me to move there. And I, we had, the Dempsey's had played up there so many times that by the time um, we stopped playing together. It it made the transition pretty easy for me because a lot I knew a lot of people up there, and um, I uh, it, it just made the it just made the move a lot easier. Uh, we we Dempsey's had played up there for ten years. We went up there about once a month and and played a club on Lower Broadway. Uh, so um, yeah, it was it was it definitely was in the cards, you know. Uh, what was the highlight, by your opinion, of playing with the Dempsey's? Well, I, one of them was, um, and I don't even remember if we played well, but one of them was beginning to open up for the Stray Cats. We, uh, we in the summer of 2004, it was one of the, we've only been, we only went to Europe twice, and we never did anything longer than like four days. We would all, we would get flown over there to do like a festival and then get flown right back. You know, it was never any sort of tour, but in the summer of 04, the stray cats reunited and did a, um, they did a, they did a tour of Europe. I don't even think they came to the United States. They did a tour of Europe and we got, we got invited to play in Gijon, Spain, which I believe is in the North of Spain. And we played in a, and this is really cool. We played in an old bullfighting arena and um, so it was a three-day festival, and we were like maybe second on the bill or something. I think the Stray Cats were maybe. I think it was like maybe five bands that day. So technically, we could say we opened up for the Stray Cats. But but I would say that that is definitely one of the highlights because I mean, as soon as we got done playing, we we just hung out and like we were on the side of the stage when 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 they took the stage, and uh, you know it was just so cool to see them back together and doing all the old songs and you know i mean we had grew, we grew we grew up loving the stray cats and modeled so much of our band on on what they did and and you know maybe too much <laughs> sometimes but but yeah that's definitely one of the highlights yeah i i remember that tour you know i was really excited i even flew from us uh to 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 paris like to see them and it was the first show on that tour on that comeback tour and they they did play in the states but just a year prior to that i think in 2003 they played in hootenanny festival and festival in los angeles uh or orange county wherever that was back then and um and then i i, I saw them at that tour i was really excited uh, and but you know it was Paris. Um, do you hear me now better? Do you hear me now at all or not? No, I guess I should keep texting. But it seems that it's working so far. Um, I just jinxed it. 
Joe disappeared. If you ha if you guys have any questions for for Joe, like please let us know in the live chat. And if you want me to to um, to feature somebody, you know, uh, write down in the comments uh, below. Um, uh, Antia is sending Joe a fantastic birthday coming on December twenty eighth. So this is. Uh, sort of a, a birthday show. Um, tell me about a time uh, that you played for uh, Japanese. Um, what is a prime prime minister and and uh, president George Bush? Yeah, we did. Um, they came to. I'll show you guys that photo. That's Joe. With George Bush and Japanese Prime Minister. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay, sorry about that. It, it keeps kicking me off. Um, yeah, that that was a really cool gig. That was um, that was at uh, Rendezvous, which is a uh, rest uh, restaurant known for its for its uh, ribs. Um, and, That's uh, my favorite. So, favorite ribs. I love that. <laughs> yeah, you've been there. Oh, many times. Yeah. You know, that's, that's one of my favorite barbecue joints in the U.S. Charcoal ribs from, you know, from Rendezvous. It's amazing. Right. So they had a, uh, a luncheon so the, so the prime minister and uh, President Bush could meet. And um, our agent, our local agent, just said, hey, I, I think I can get you guys on this thing. Um, you know, you'll have to play quiet and, and you'll be, <laughs> you'll be off to the side. Um, it was pretty cool. The one, the one thing I remember about that gig is, uh, <laughs> I got your text rendezvous rules. Yeah. Uh, the, the one thing I remember about that gig was the, the day before, um, well, actually two things. This is kind of cool. Two things. Uh, the day before We can hear you now. Okay, good. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, so when, when we pulled up to the gig to load in, like we, our van was swarmed with service agents um, because, you know, is there, anytime, anytime the president goes anywhere, they have to make sure, you know, they know everything that's coming in there, who's coming in there, uh, what you're doing. And, and the other cool thing was my, at the time, my my drummer's wife was pregnant with their first um, with their first child, and they were supposed to deliver, like she was supposed to go into labor, deliver uh, that uh, the day of the gig, and so she you know she she realized what what a, what a cool opportunity it would be to to do something like that. So they actually moved <laughs> they actually moved and induced I think maybe two nights prior, and um, my. Uh, my drummer brought like an eight, like a eight by ten picture of his newborn and had it signed by uh, President Bush. So that's just what I remember about it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, tell me about you. Send me a photo of a DJ Fontana and his drums. Tell me about this kid. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, okay. So um, DJ's drums. It's really cool. DJ lives, uh, or DJ lived in Antioch, which I believe is just a little bit south of here. And um, so when, when we would come up from Memphis, we would give him a call every now and then be like, hey, we're in town. And he's like, yeah, you got to come by the house. We'll have dinner. So 
uh, we went to his house and he took us upstairs and he, where he showed us basically the, he still has that Gretsch kit that Elvis bought for him in 1955. And, um, he, it on, on the bass drum is that kind of calf skin. Um, and you see it in all the old pictures. It's got a kind of a funky design on it. And, um, I something had happened between <clears throat> the third is, yeah, something had happened between the fifties and, um, whenever that was, it was probably like the early two thousands. Anyway, he had that, he had that calfskin remade. And, and if you look at the old pictures, I mean, it looks identical to it, but so yeah, we got to, we got to check out that original drum kit and I know he was trying to get, he was trying to get some money for it. I know he, he kind of had like, you know, his ceiling was, I think, I don't know if I should say it, but he was, I think he was trying to get like a hundred thousand dollars for that drum kit. And he said that he wouldn't, he wouldn't back off it unless he could get that. And so he decided to keep it. Now I don't know if he ever got that. I don't know if he ever sold it, but uh, that is the kit that you see pretty much, you know, in every, every picture of the, uh, of Elvis, and quite, quite possibly on, That's the, crazy. on the TV shows as so well. Cool. That's so cool. Um, who are the uh, bands, like once you moved to Nashville, who are the bands that you started playing with? Right. Um, well, uh, when I first moved to Nashville, um, I played with a guy named uh, Travis Mann. And it was just like a... Uh, four piece kind of honky tonk band, acoustic guitar, uh, drums, and uh, a hot Telecaster player. We had a guy named uh, Matt Lee for a while that was really good. And uh, he actually has a, some instructional videos out now. And uh, so I played with Travis for about a year and a half. <clears throat> and um, I played uh, in a rockabilly band uh, on Tuesday nights at Roberts. Um, that Travis Mann gig was at a place called the Full Moon Saloon. These are all like lower Broadway, lower Broadway honky tonks. And back then it was pretty cool because it's not so much like that now because you have a lot, a lot, a lot of the clubs now just do a lot of the new pop country. But, but back then you could literally play all day long. You could, you know, the clubs open at 11 AM and they close at 2 AM and you have, you have bands that kind of play around the clock. So you have like 11 to two band, then you have a two to six band, six to 10, 10 to two. And, um, so I would, you know, I would play with Travis and then I might run over to, to Roberts and play with, you know, Harry Fontana. He had, he's a rockabilly singer from Finland that uh, found a home in Nashville. And, you know, he's been around town forever. And uh, pretty much everybody that's a kind of a roots musician has been through Harry's band or been through Travis's band. You know, a lot of guys, they, they'll use lower Broadway sort of to <clears throat> anchor themselves in town until they maybe go back out on the road with whoever they're playing with. And and I always, I always just like the idea of just making Broadway kind of my, you know, my home and making it my living. Um, in 2011, um, Dave Rowe retired from the Don Kelly band, and um, so I ended up getting I ended up getting that gig, and that was a that was a great gig. It was it was like a five nights a week. You play you play Wednesday through Saturday, 6:30 to 10. There it is. <laughs> And, uh, and the Sunday nights, 10 to two and, uh, Don Kelly, he's been around Nashville for, he's been in Nashville since 1976, which that was the year I was born. So that's to give you some perspective. He's 74 years old now. And he is always, uh, he's always had a house. Uh, he's always had like a house gig somewhere, which that was really kind of prevalent in the seventies and eighties in Nashville. You, most clubs had their house band that would play six, seven nights a week. And, Don played, um, he played at a place called the Stagecoach Lounge. Um, and he played there, uh, he played there, uh, seven nights a week. And then, um, um, and then in the nineties, he kind of bounced around, but, but right around 1997, he, uh, he, he came to Robert's Western world and, uh, he knew Robert Moore, the owner from way back. And, uh, that was when BR five for nine was playing there. And, um, so Don would play, six to 10 Wednesday through Saturday and BR, I think would play, I, I might be wrong on this. They would play uh, Wednesday, 10 to two. So right after Don and they did that for, for a few years and then they got their record deal and they went out on the road. And then um, uh, uh, Jesse Lee Jones and his band, Brazil, Billy took, 
took that late shift. So, but Don held on to that. Don held on to that uh, shift for 23 years at Roberts. I don't think he ever took a vacation. And um, he just retired this year because of the pandemic. He's 74 and, you know, he doesn't want to get sick. And, and uh, you know, I think it just put a lot of things in perspective for a lot of us musicians. But anyway, I, I, I played with Don for for nine years and two weeks, <laughs> every week. Wow, that's crazy. And yeah. how about uh, uh, how about Eskimo Brothers? Eskimo Brothers, yeah. Um, well, uh, Harry Fontana's band. There we go. That's that's David Graham right there on the left playing guitar. Now I met David uh, on a Harry Fontana gig at Roberts. He was playing drums for Harry, which is that rockabilly trio I was telling you about. And uh, I didn't even realize that David played guitar. And then Harry got him out one night, you know, and Harry said, let me play drums. You play guitar. And David got out front and started playing and singing. And I was like, man, this guy's really good. And so we played in Harry's band probably for about three years together. And I knew he had a band called the Eskimo brothers. Um, and they were starting to, they were starting to go on the road and start, you know, they were kind of using Broadway to kind of advertise and then they'd get out and play on the weekends and, you know, in Memphis or, or wherever. But anyway, but around 2013, David's bass player uh, quit. And, and so he, he hired me for a couple of gigs. I said, man, I, I said, I'd love to play with you more. I said, the only, my only thing is, is I've been playing with Don Kelly for like three years. And I said, if I, is there any way I could just maybe do some in town gigs and then you play or, you know, and then, you know, he basically worked with me. So he's got Mark Robertson from the Shack Shakers at, at, that plays on the road with him. And I, I do a handful of gigs in town every week. And um, we've actually made it work pretty well. You know, it, it's uh, uh, it, it's it's worked surprisingly well, considering that, you know, sometimes you want to put your best foot forward. and You don't want to be using a bunch of different band members. But but he's you know, he's been really good to me. And, and uh, I. Uh, when Don retired this year, I, I kind of brought David on uh, as as a singer in the group. You know, we needed another singer, and uh, he's a great front person. And um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's good to have him in my corner. <laughs> That's great. Uh, how did you hook up with uh, Drake Bell? We both of us played with Drake. I mean, I still play with Drake, and then I actually had to learn some of some of your licks. Uh, you know, for the first show that I played with him when we were supporting, when we were guests of Brian Setzer Orchestra show. How, how, I'm curious to hear, how did you hook up with him? The Drake, yeah, the Drake Bell thing, um, it was, uh, you know, I never, I, I'm not really sure how I got the call for that. I know that there was a gentleman named Peter Collins that was working on the record, um, and he had, he was a pretty big producer in the eighties from what I understand. I think he produced one of rush, one of Rush's records, I guess. But, um, I think I might have met him at Roberts. Um, and I think he said, give me a call. Um, and I'm trying to think, I, I just remember, I remember Brian Setzer also being a, a producer on that, on that session. Like, at least he got credit for it, but I never saw him at the studio. So I worked with Peter Collins and um, uh, there was an amazing drummer. He's a studio guy here in town named Chad Cromwell. And he was like kind of this, one of these guys that you go in there and you know, he one takes everything. We run through the song and he plays it perfect. And so you're like, Oh boy, you know, like, you know, I don't do a ton of studio work, you know, I'm like, maybe you should call Dave Rowe or maybe, you know, maybe you should call Dennis Crouch or something, but I, you know, once you get in a situation like that, you're like, well, I guess they called me, so that's fine. So, I, I did, I recorded a handful of songs with those guys, and um, I, uh, Drake was a super, super nice guy. I, I saw him at Roberts Western World before I really knew who he was. He came in there one night, stuck out like a sore thumb. He had a leather jacket on and a big pompadour, and I was like, who's this guy? It doesn't look like your normal tourist. And then like a couple of days later, he's the guy that walks into the studio. I'm like, oh, that's that's that guy. Okay. But um I I was just really impressed. He was he Drake definitely knew what he wanted out of that session. I mean, he was like, and he was kind of kind of a I don't know if you I don't know if you got this impression, but he seemed like kind of a per perfectionist. And and that was like it was really cool to work with somebody that could just kind of be like, 
yeah, no, yeah, I want that, do that, you know, so as opposed to sort of being like, I don't know what this guy wants, but um, so I, I think I recorded maybe three or four songs, and um, I want to say we did that song, Bold, that we were talking about earlier, there's a uh, crazy little thing called Love, and um, there was that other one that we talked about, it's kind of almost a straight cat, stratish kind of, kind of song. Sunny but Afternoon. Yes, yes, that one. And um, well, that was, and I told you about that. It was, um, they wanted me to do kind of, um, kind of some, you know, they're just like play, you know, do some of those triplets, do some of those drag things kind of. And uh, so I started to do some stuff and he was like, that's great. And then I got too fancy and he was like, no, don't do that. So, <laughs> you know, I was, I'm always like trying to like take it up a level. And, and I realized like, man, some of that stuff just doesn't transfer very good in the studio. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, simple, simpler is better. So I got away with, I would say I got away with more than, than I, you know, maybe someone else would let me get away with rhythmically in the studio. You know, I definitely kind of bulldozed my way through on a couple of those lines. And uh, can you show us what you played on that record? Like those lines that you were just talking about? Can you show us, can you show us what you played on that record? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't remember. Okay, let me get my bass real quick. Oh, sunny afternoon. Okay, you want me to do that one? Sure. Was it in? Um, do you uh, do you do you remember what key that was in? Was it in? Is it like D? I believe like it was in one? A. Oh, in A. Okay. So it was like kind of kind of one of these kind of. Yeah. Something like that. Exactly. Okay, so I, I think I think what I was able to get away with was this. And I think what I might have been adding in there was like. You know, quadruple, you know, the kind of stuff that would probably uh, disrupt more than add to the um, song. So. It's. It, it sounds great. And I remember that I had to learn those lines, you know, before I joined the band. I would like to hear you play something solo. Do you mind uh, sure. playing something for us? Okay. Sounds good. So cool. I love it, man. So great. Uh, Thanks, man. 
And the comment that you got from Voodoo is, there goes another base of mine on the fire. And you have hand claps from Carolyn. Um, <laughs> is the connection better now? Do you, do, can you hear me now better? I can't hear you. Uh, I'm curious a, you're, to hear you're about up. the role uh, in the Johnny Cash movie. Um, let me write that down. Uh, yeah, tell me about the, the 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 role that you played in the Johnny Cash movie. You were a you were a Bill Black in Elvis Presley's band, right? Sure, I can tell you. Yeah, Johnny Cash movie. Yeah, um, that was uh, that was kind of like. All right, I was getting ready to listen to Joe, but uh, he disappeared again. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar. Uh, Joe Fick was a bass player. He was Bill Black and in. In Elvis Presley, sorry, in Elvis Presley's band in Johnny Cash movie, um, Walk the Line. So I'm gonna let you talk about it. I'm back. <laughs> okay, Johnny Cash movie. Yeah, um, I always tell people it's just pretty much being at the right place at the right time. Um, when the production team for that movie came to town, um, they were basically just they wanted to shoot a majority of it in Memphis um, because, uh, you know, they wanted to try to get as, as close, as close to the real deal as possible. So we, the Dempsey's came up on a, on a list of musicians to call for, for principal cast members, you know, extra musicians. They needed guys to back up the, the actor that was um, Carl Perkins or the actor that would be Jerry Lee Lewis. And um, so we didn't know anything about it. We just heard, Johnny Cash movie, they want you guys to come down and audition. And we were like, okay, well, we, you know, we can do this. So we went to the kind of a, like a cattle call and we played, I think we played Folsom Prison Blues. And then of course, like we get done, they're like, that was great. So yeah, we already have Johnny's band uh, casted, but we need, <laughs> we need some guys that can be uh, extra musicians, you know, we're going to have someone playing Elvis and we're going to have someone playing Jerry Lee Lewis. And uh, I think they had a Roy Orbison. And uh, anyway, um, our, our drummer, who was sort of Ron Perone, who was sort of handling our, all of our affairs at the time, he kind of booked the band. He talked to, he talked to someone at the studio and just said, Hey, look, you know, we're, we're a band and we, we really know how to play that Elvis stuff. Well, and if we could be Elvis's band, you know, we'd do a really good job for you. And they were like, okay, well, we'll take that in consideration. So we did a couple of more uh, auditions. And then like by the third audition, we were, we were starting to be like, do we, are we in this thing or not? So we, we did the, we, the third audition was actually uh, playing with uh, Tyler Hilton, who was the guy that played Elvis. We got on stage and we did a couple of songs and uh, the director came up. He's like, that's great guys. That's great. Okay. Uh, so and he just starts talking to her and we're like, well, so do we have this gig or not? And he's like, oh yeah, nobody, nobody told you. <laughs> so we're like, no, nobody told us. And he's like, oh no, yeah, absolutely. You guys are, you guys are great. We're just go over and get, get fitted for your outfits and go get your hair done and, and uh, meet on these, meet on these days. And, and um, so, yeah, we were, we were pretty stoked. I mean, cause we were, you know, we, we'd seen a lot of, we've, we've seen a lot of those biopics, um, where, you know, they have like Elvis at Sun Studio and there's a saxophone player. And you're just like, that's not right. There was never a saxophone player. So we were like, man, this is our our chance to really do DJ Scotty and Bill justice, you know. So when 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 we finally got onto set, we were so lucky. The the prop guys, um, they were they were really hell bent on on making everything look kind of period and using the correct instruments and, uh, you know, just making sure that, you know, if someone was wearing a watch that it was from the fifties or whatever, you know, it wasn't, you know, they were really, you know, they were really detailed about that, which was really cool. Um, so, uh, I get, I get, I think, I can't remember what scene, I can't remember what scene it was. It might've been that one at Sun Studio that you put up earlier, 
Um, but they had, so they had the kind of the dark base. And I, I took, I asked one of the prop guys, I said, look, do you mind if I take white masking? There it is. Yeah. I said, do you mind if I take white masking tape and go around the edges with it? And he's like, yeah, is that, is that what they did? I said, oh man, I said, any picture of Bill Black, you see, he's got that, that little white guard, which I actually think was masking tape from what I've heard to protect the edges. But anyway, he, he let me do that myself. So I just right there in that room, which that, by the way, that's not Sun Studio right there. That is, that is a, that is on South Main in Memphis. If you go down near the arcade and Ernestine and Hazel's, there was, there was a, there was like a little warehouse that was just abandoned and Sun Studio wouldn't let, uh, they wouldn't let the, the crew shoot there. Um, I think they wanted a lot of money and they wanted them to keep all the pictures on the wall. So, I mean, it wouldn't make sense if Elvis was there and there was a picture of Elvis on the wall. So they constructed their own Sun Studio. And I kid you not, man, you walk in that, you walk in that room and, and you cannot tell the difference. I actually got married at Sun Studio. So I know, I, I know all about, like, I know exactly what that room looks like. And I've done a bunch of sessions there. And, but you walk in that room right there and it is just like a dead ringer for Sun. So I put that white piping on the, on the, um, on the bass and um, pretty sure, pretty sure the guitar and the amp were close to, what Scotty was using. I didn't, I didn't mess with that. Cause I was, you know, I'm a bass player, not a guitar player. So, but we did, uh, we did. That's so we, cool. Yeah. That's so cool. It's a good opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Right place, yeah. right time. I would like, what did you say? I couldn't hear what you said, um, but I would like to switch our talk a little bit towards bass now. Uh, who would be your biggest influences on on your bass playing? Biggest influences on bass playing, yeah. <clears throat> um, well. Let's see. I would say, I mean, I would say for starters, I mean, it, it for me, it starts with, you know, Bill Black. Um, and especially just for simple, you know, pocket playing. Um, and then now I'm just talking like, I'll talk to the old guys and I'll talk to new guys. So I think like the, the, the old school guys, definitely Bill Black. I think Marshall Lytle, of course, you know, um, Let's see, you know, Willie Dixon, a lot of the same names that we that we hear uh, week after week on the slap stream, but they, they definitely are worth mentioning. Um, <clears throat> let's see, um, Bob Moore, Milt Hinton. Um, I like I like a lot of that 1920s, 1920s jazz where it's all like kind of single pole stuff like Bill Johnson, like <laughs> You know, I, it's that kind of stuff that Ryan Gould's so good at. <laughs> uh, that kind of stuff, I love listening to it. It sort of eludes me on how they do it and how they keep their wrists so loose. But and then and then some of the new guys, um, Kevin Smith, of course. I kind of changed my life when I got I got a copy of uh, Stranger Things from High Noon, and it's got. Uh, let me put this down. It's got the blue bonnet boogie on there and, and long empty stretch of highway. And, you know, I learned, spent a lot of time learning his, his, his licks, if you will. Um, Dave Rowe is a big influence. Um, I'd say Dave really watching him play with the Don Kelly band and Johnny Cash. And he played with Billy Burnett. Uh, Dave was such a, <clears throat> such a good, um, I love how he basically kind of makes you wait for it with the slap thing. I mean, he, there are tunes that he might slap through the whole song, like a Johnny Cash tune, which is, I feel is totally appropriate, but Dave is, <laughs> Ryan, shucks, man. Uh, but Dave is, um, Dave is like, he, he will make, he will pick out a section of the song to really punctuate with the slap bass thing. And that is something that, especially in the last 10 years, I've, 
have really adopted that that style, which is, and I love slap bass more than anybody. You know, I mean, I'm I'm with all you guys on this slap stream. I I just I'm I'm, I'm tuned into every episode of this thing. But for me, I feel like if you do it on every song and you do it through the whole night, you know, by the end of the night, I think the audience is just kind of numb to it. And so I, I like to kind of pick and choose my spots now. And cause you really, when you do, when you do start slapping people, you just see people kind of perk up. What, what was that? You know? And, um, and same with soloing, you know, if you wait all the way till the solo and then you kind of dig into it, I mean, it really, I think it really creates, um, I think it really creates the release intention. So, um, Dave Rowe, let's see who else. Um, I know there's a, there's a ton of others. George A. Stiapovich, um, <laughs> Nicola D. Boucher, um, <clears throat> and uh, oh, and uh, in the last ten years, um, and you and you and you and Nicola basically hipped me to this guy, which is uh, Jill Shevishery. I love that guy, and and um, so the <laughs> let's see that guy who else. Yeah, I'd say Jill Shevishery kind of set the bar for me on like, whoa, I mean, that, he plays in such a, he plays in such a unique style. Um, I remember you coming to my house about 10 years ago and, you know, we were talking about his style and you said, yeah, he, he really doesn't even know how to do like a triplet. Like he, it, that's not even his thing. His thing is all pull-ups and, um, you know, the kind of the Willie Dixon quadruple into the pull-off. And it's just, so it's really like, I, I've probably found every video on YouTube of him playing um and it's just uh yeah i keep kind of going back to that guy just for his just for his originality really who else yeah jill is great you know i i was i had a chance like to meet him and play his bass and he's he was a really cool really cool really cool guy you know nikolai and me went on his uh, 60th birthday party and you know both of us will remember that experience for a long time it's really cool. Uh, how did you develop your your particular style of playing? How did you develop your style of playing? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know if I have a style. I guess um, I feel like I, I feel like it's kind of like all of us, where it's like you you start kind of emulating your heroes. So I would say like. I would say thank you. <laughs> Georgie said, you do have your own style. Um, I would say that, you know, so it was like Elvis, Bill Black, you know, Lee Rocker. I would say those guys were basically, uh, up until I saw Kevin Smith, I think that, you know, to me it was just like those guys just kept great rhythm, good showman. And and to me that was that was great. I think when I, I think when I got hip to what, what the slap bass could be. I think it was when I heard the Kevin Smith stuff. And then I heard, you know, Willie Dixon and all of the, just all the variations within rhythm. Um, I think that sort of like opened up the door to like, whoa, okay. So the possibilities are, you know, there, there are more ways to skin a cat. Right. So I guess, and then I guess the Dempsey's we played we played everything so fast like everything was just like crazy fast that I think maybe like if I played like a Kevin Smith lick like just really fast it sounded like oh wow that's his own thing but really if you slow it down it's probably just something that I caught, I caught off a high noon record or something um, I know in the last ten years especially I know since I moved to Nashville because the idea for me when I moved to Nashville was I don't really want to. I kind of want to blend in and be a side guy for a while. I don't, you know, the Dempsey's I was kind of co-fronting with Brad and, and, you know, it's great fronting a band, but at the same time, if it, if it doesn't go well, it's like, it's like, ugh, it's on your shoulders. So when I got to Nashville, it was, it was really nice to just kind of sink into the background and just r really work on my bass playing. And so the idea was that I wanted to kind of try to come up with some stuff that was maybe my own. And um, so about 10 years ago is kind of when YouTube really started to like take off. And so I saw, you know, I saw your atomic boogie and I saw those videos that, that Nicola put up and the artist slap bass website that you, that you started, you started featuring. <clears throat> I think Bo sample has a video on there, which is great. 
I always go back and watch that one because there's really cool syncopation in there. Um, that's another guy I want to mention that's awesome. Him, Jimmy Sutton, of course, Jake Irwin. Any guy, any of those guys that played on the Wayne Hancock records, those guys are great. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I just think that I just think that I got on YouTube all the time, was just looking for different guys and what do they do? And and so you kind of you kind of learn a lick that maybe somebody does and then you you try to, you know, they might be doing it like a like a Jill Shebashri lick, like I, I do a Jill Shepherd look like in a Johnny Cash song, you know, he's doing it in like a, in a, you know, like a Cindy Bechet song. So, you know, I try, you know, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to steal anybody's stuff, but I would kind of maybe get an idea, you know, like, Oh, that's cool. I wonder if that would work here. And then, you know, and then eventually after a while of, of playing, maybe somebody's lick or whatever, it kind of becomes your own. You, you kind of, um, it was kind of like us earlier when we were trying to, I was showing you one thing and then you play it a little bit different. You know, you play it with a drag triplet and I'm playing it with a quadruplet and it, it's like everybody's hands are a little bit different and everybody's sense of time and their ideas about music. And um, so I think really it was just, you know, I, I just was kind of just immersed in it on YouTube and listening to different players. And then, and then also all the time that I spent on lower Broadway, I mean, literally like, <clears throat> I probably played like, you know, get any given year between 2010, 2020, I probably played probably 500 shifts on Broadway, which is like most of those I was doubling up. I'd be like, do two on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, two on Thursday, maybe two on Friday, two on Sunday, one on Saturday. And that's like each shift is like four hours with no break. So it gives you a ton of time to work stuff out. You know, I might work something out at home be like, ah, I wonder if that's going to work today, go down there and then like fall flat on my face and then be like, okay, well that didn't work. Go home, come back the next day. And all the gigs were a little different too. So you'd have like one where it was like <clears throat> a rockabilly gig and one was like more of a country gig. And um, so I definitely, I mean, just putting in the time down there helped me kind of figure out what's going to work and uh, what's not. Um, that's great. And oh, oh, you mentioned, you know, the people that kind of influenced your bass playing, but I would like to hear, uh, by your opinion, what would be the most essential slap bass recordings? If you can point out to something. That's a good question. <clears throat> that's a really good question. I was thinking about this cause I, I watch this show all the time. Um, uh, if I was, if I was teaching and I was, I'm just trying to teach the basics to somebody. Uh, I think that Elvis the Sun Sessions would be the first, the first one I'd recommend because not only is it great bass playing and it, and it's pretty simple. Um, they're, they're on most of those cuts don't have any drums on them, so you don't have the distraction of trying to figure out who's doing what. Um, I think that that's that's part of the problem. I think you know when you, when you're starting out is, um, whoa, was that the drums doing that or was that the bass doing that? So with the Sun Sessions, I mean, it is so cut and dry, you know, three instruments, you know, guitar, guitar, and bass. And also, you know, here, let me get my bass real quick here. The great thing about the Sun Sessions is you pretty much have, you pretty much have the basic slaps. Um, you pretty much have the basic slaps uh, that you need. So you have like, that's all right, mama, you know. Okay, then you have um, Mystery Train, which is just like it's 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 even simpler. It's just it's just one note being pedaled with a with the triple slap, you know. Okay, then that's all right, Mama. And in the solo, you know, Bill Black walks the bass, so, that, so all of a sudden we get into to walking feel. Okay, and then. Um, with something like um, Good Rockin' Tonight, you have your kind of swinging walking bass line. Okay, so so that's that's why I think that like anybody that's gonna anybody that's starting out, I think the uh, the uh, let me straighten this out. Sorry, the Elvis recordings are are I think they're so essential. I think too the obviously like we talked about earlier, <clears throat> the Bill Haley and the Comet recordings are great for those kind of walking shuffle bass lines. Um, I think, 
I think when you get into a little bit more complex, if you want to start getting into all the different rhythms and stuff, then, you know, obviously like um, <clears throat> anything Willie Dixon, probably, probably more of that stuff with him in Memphis Slim, where he gets to kind of stretch out and take solos, you know, rock in the house. And um, the, the, there's a live record from Paris uh, that's really good. Um, I think any Stray Cat record's really good. Um, and I, and I, and one that I don't hear mentioned very often, but I think once again, if you're learning the upright bass and you want to learn how to slap and play in time with good feel, uh, any of those Wayne Hancock records from the early, the mid nineties on, I think, I mean, there's, who was it? Rick Ramirez and there's Kevin Smith and Billy Bratcher and, and all those guys, they all kind of, they all had kind of similar styles. And I think if you're just wanting to kind of discern what, what, what the bass is doing without the distraction of the drums. Uh, those records are great. Hot Club of Cowtown too, because there's not a, not a drummer. And I mentioned that just because, you know, we didn't have things like uh, YouTube and all that when we were kids. So we really had to, you know, rewind, drop the needle, you know, figure out, well, who's doing what on that record? So yeah, those are my, I guess those would be my essentials. Those are great essentials. And, uh, I love them. Uh, you mentioned um, a little bit the, the 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 names of different uh, slab bass patterns, and I would like to to for you to grab the bass now and show us, um, and and tell us what are the the names of the different slab bass patterns that you use. What would be a single slab for you? What would be a double slab, and and so on. Okay. Well, I think I'm pretty much, I think I'm pretty much with you on, uh, and the art of slap bass with what is, um, what's what, but, um, I will say there was a time where I think I was a little confused on what was, on what was what I think initially, maybe prior to 10 years ago, I might've, I might've called this, I might've called that a double slap, but now I understand that we are count we're counting the the actual slap of the string and the two hits so that makes that a triple slap so so if we start from the beginning we have the snap okay or the single slap okay okay and then we get into double which basically i just played that line right there and now you just add you're just going to add a slapping between each beat Okay, so that would make it a double slap. Um, triple slap to me now um, would be Johnny Cash, you know. Okay. Um, and there's also the triple slap, but with a that's more of a straight feel, and then you have kind of uh, like a shuffly swing feel. So the same same line played just with a swinging feel. Okay, um, so that and then okay, so triple slap, uh, triple it, of course. So that always works really good, you know, in walking walking bass lines. I learned that one from Lee Rocker. You know, he did that a ton of times and on that Rock Tokyo video. So I learned a triplet from him. Um, and then we get into the uh, dra uh, drag triplet, which would be uh, we, like um, I think Brent Harding called it the uh, the Kevin. I like that. So that's the where you drag your palm. And I never called it a, I never called it a drag triplet. When I first learned that, um, I called it a rake because you were raking the strings. It was only later, only maybe like ten years later that I heard it called a, a drag triplet. So, so that's what I call that. You can do it. You can do it with uh, a couple of different strings too. You can go, or you can go. You don't. You don't necessarily have to. Use that. Let me, sorry, move this down a little bit. You see what I'm doing? 
So there's a great Pete Turlin video on, on YouTube. Um, and he, he teaches the, uh, he teaches the, 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 that quick triplet like that too, where he goes, and I think he, I think maybe he's attributes it, attributes it to Willie Dixon, but I'm not really sure where it comes from. Okay. So that's still your, that's still a triplet, I guess. Right. And then we get into, um, quadruplets. So four, um, I know, Georgie, you do it this way. You go. For some reason, I can't get the timing right on that. So I, I have adopted the one that Nicola put on, on YouTube, which is the, we kind of roll your hand like this. So I do. So that's, uh, let's see, it's a pink, pinky thumb hand. Yeah. So you could actually do the you could actually do the Willie Dixon with that if you wanted to. You could go. I have to do it up high because the action of my strings gets lower up here. But it, it's the same as doing this one. Okay. So that's a quadruple. That's let's see. That's quad quadruplet. That's, and then there's the drag quadruplet, which is kind of what we talked about earlier, which is, okay, so that's like, as opposed to it being like four hits over one bar, this is just like one note, kind of like the drag triplet. Now you have, and that's like a friend of mine calls it the karate chop. So it's like you come, you start here, hit here, boom, pull. That kind of enables you to do like what we were talking about earlier, which is like, you know, you kind of skip around and you don't, you don't, with the drag triple, you kind of have to cock back and get ready for it. So this one just enables you to do that. Um, <clears throat> it's also another one kind of fun is a uh, uh, two handed <laughs> two-handed two uh, uh, quadruplet. So, like, so just, once again, you could do the Willie Dixon thing. Okay, so that's that's a drag triplet in this hand, and a and like a hit with this hand. So you create four. And really fast, it's like. Uh, so that's kind of fun. It's, that works good on a walking bass line. Um, and then, um, like, I, I call them, like, single poles or double poles, like kind of like the Jill Chevrochery thing, which is like and so that's like that's kind of what he does. <laughs> okay, and then he adds like um he'll add the that like uh so that's that Willie Dixon thing that Pete Turlin talked about so he goes but something like that and then um uh let's see <clears throat> just uh hammer ons and pull offs that kind of thing but uh I think that about covers it. <laughs> uh, do you mind uh, playing something since you have a bass with you? Sure. All right. Play a long okay. solo. <laughs> <clears throat> and you know these patterns. I love them, man. I love them. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm a big fan of the art of slap bass. <laughs> <laughs> waiting for it to I'm waiting for it to shoot some videos up. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, we'll keep key of F. Awesome. I threw them all awesome. in there, man. Killer, man. <laughs> Killer. Um, a question, you know, since, you know, we are, you know, big fans of, uh, uh, both of us are big fans of uh, of slab bass and we use it, we love to use it often. Um, I'm curious to hear what your uh, band leaders usually say about it. Do they ever tell you, hey, do not play this much slap or are you play a little more slap and stuff like that. Okay, right. So if anybody's tuning in right now, I can't hear what Georgie's saying. So he's texting me the questions. So the question is, do I do the band leaders ever tell me when or when not to slap? Does that become an issue? Um, <clears throat> well, I would say that by the time I moved to Nashville, um, I was, I was ready to sort of um, kind of dial it back a little bit. <laughs> With the Dempsey's, it was like everything was on 11, including the slap. And it was great. And we were known for that. But I was, you know, it was, I think we were all ready to be a little bit more musical. And um, so when I got to Nashville, I was really sensitive to like, no, don't, you know, don't slap here. Maybe you should not do it on this song. And um like and like I said earlier, Dave Rowe was a huge influence on that. I mean, he was he's just so tasteful with his playing. And um so I watched him a ton with the Don Kelly band from I mean all the way from the late nineties up until he retired in two thousand eleven. And he um just always knew the right spots to put it in and, and when to lay back and so the 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 Don Kelly band, which is the band I played with for nine years, um Don kind of knew Don kind of knew the places where I should slap. So if it was a Johnny Cash song, then it was pretty much from the downbeat all the way to the end of the song. If it was like a bluegrass song, which we, we, we usually did one of those per set, you know, kind of a fast, you know, fast breakdown kind of song. Um, he, he had his spots that he would, he'd say like slap here, yeah, don't slap there, you know, and then he'd always give me a solo. So, and I think the idea was that you don't, you know, you don't slap, a guitar player takes a break. Maybe you slap behind him to kind of give the song a lift. But then the guitar player takes another break. You don't slap there because your solo is coming up. And then when that solo happens, it it just it just it explodes. You know, it's like it it uh it it's just captures the audience's imagination right there. It's like oh my god, well what is this? So so I got kind of hip to that way of thinking, and um, I kind of tried to apply it to to everything, you know that I did. I, in fact, I, I would say that I, I could probably slap more now, but I like to kind of pick and choose my spots and I haven't really been, I haven't really been called out on it. I don't, I don't think I have at least, but uh, like I said, I, I, I think, uh, I think that's kind of been my thing is I want to, I want to try to be more song oriented, but also, you know, get, have my little spots to do my thing, which is cool. Um, you were, I, I want to mention something my father-in-law, I think I mentioned this earlier, he he played bass for Ralph Stanley. Um, 
in the 2000s, right around the time that uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou came out, and they had kind of a lot of success. And um, but what one bass player I'd never hear mentioned in bluegrass is uh, is uh, Jack Cook, and he played with Ralph Stanley in the 70s and 80s. I think he played in the 60s too. But he he actually slapped quite a bit for a bluegrass player. And I know you have bluegrass guys on here every now and then, and and girls. And you talk about um, you talk about uh, like. You know, do we slap in bluegrass or do we not? And uh, I know for a fact that Jack Cook he slapped quite a bit in those in, in a lot in the live the live recordings. Um, there's a great like live recording of Ralph Stanley from 1977 with Keith Whitley, and there's quite a bit of slapping in there. And um, and my father-in-law actually told me that Ralph Stanley always liked it when he slapped the bass. He said, oh, "I really like it when you do that." So. I don't know if across the board, I don't know if Flatt and Scruggs and Bill Monroe liked it, but I definitely know that Ralph Stanley liked that style of bass. Now, whether it's, he liked it all the time or not, I don't know. But but uh, Jack Cook, if you if you look at those old clips, he's definitely slapping bass part of the time. That's so cool. I didn't know. I'm I am familiar with Jack Cook, but I'm not familiar with that story. And I'm glad you you know you mentioned that. Um, do you have uh, any advice how to get a gig? I mean, especially in Nashville when, you know, there's like so many, so many people. How do you get involved with the band and how do you uh, find your own place in a, such a crazy town, such a music mecca like Nashville? Advice on how to get a gig? Um, that's a good question. I think, I think it. I think it depends. Maybe kind of what where you are in your, especially in Nashville. Okay. Um, I think it kind of depends on where you are in your career. I think, I, I always recommend like if you're young, teenagers or whatever, and you want to be like in the music business, which you know like it's forever changing. So, what what worked 20 years ago might, might not work now. But I, I was always like find two or three, four like-minded friends of yours that all share interest in music, that all want to play together, start a band, you know, try to, I mean, because, you know, like chances are when you're 18, 19, you're, you're playing on the edge of your ability. You're, you're not a fully developed player. It's very rare that you, you find a fully developed player at 18, you know? So it's like, <clears throat> get, you know, get some guys together, have a plan, you know, I mean, you know, a band's kind of like a gang. So it's like, we're going to do this, man. We're, you know, every weekend we're going to be out playing every, you know. So I think the idea is like that. I, I mean, if I would recommend it would be find, get a band, work as much as you can. Like no gig is not, uh, not, not cool. You know, like you take those, take those uh, uh, sports bar gigs, take, those wedding gigs take the uh grand opening for the post office take the <laughs> i say that because i've actually done that uh don't turn any work down you know get 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 these guys together be a band get good figure out what works figure out kind of how the music industry works and then if you actually end up if you actually end up moving to like an industry town like nashville or la or new york i, I don't i don't know how it works out there but i know in nashville you know Having some talent definitely definitely helps, but I also know that like kind of being easygoing and um, you know kind of a go with the flow kind of person certainly helps. I know when I first got here, I was just sort of like, well, I've been doing this for 15 years, but I'm not going to assume that uh, that my reputation is going to help me. You know, fortunately, it did. It was like a lot of people knew who I was, but I wasn't going to march into anybody's gig. And just assume that um, because I've been in, in the Dempsey's or because I've been in Walk the Line or whatever, like I didn't care about any of that. In fact, I was kind of looking forward to a new start and kind of having to reprove myself. So I probably practiced more than I ever did when I first moved to Nashville than I did, you know, in in, in the Dempsey's or in Memphis. But but yeah, I think like you know, like they say, um, the hang is is like a big part of the is a big part of the, the gig. And to quote, to quote my old band leader, Don Kelly, I think he, I think I'll kind of paraphrase, but he basically said, I'll take a lesser player than someone who's a 
an a-hole. You know what I mean? Like someone that's great, but is really difficult. Like, you know, and he got to the point where he was just, he was just too old for the BS. You know, he was just like, man, I've been doing this too long. I will take a guy that, that I can maybe train on the bandstand or, you know, that that's just a nice guy. That's what he would, he would always say that about people. He'd always say, Oh yeah, that guy, he's a, he's a real nice guy, you know? And, and I think that, that goes along, that goes a long way. When you hear someone say that it's like, okay, well, the bottom line is everybody in Nashville has got talent. You know, there's a ton of great players, but you know, I mean, if you get in a situation where you're being hired by a band leader, you know, the band leader's job is already difficult enough. You know, he's got to make sure everyone shows up on time. He's got to call the songs. He's got to, he, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole weight of the world's on his shoulders or her shoulders. So you're you're trying to make you're trying to make their job as easy as possible. You're trying to give them as le- as little grief as they can. So sometimes it's almost like the music kind of comes second to running a band. And um, so yeah, I just say like being being you know if you're young, start a band. Get get, get your experience th- through that. If when you get older and you maybe arrive in the you know you're the hot shot in your hometown and you finally you know you make the move to wherever. The, the industry town, Austin or, or, or Nashville or whatever, you know, then it's time to sort of realize that there's like probably 50 of you there already. So being a cool guy, you know, that's going to go a long way. Absolutely. I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, do you have any advice uh, for other bass players? And maybe can you point out some of the mistakes that you might have dead in your mm. career that you could avoid and tell people not to do them? Well, I think I probably, I think, <clears throat> I think I probably make the biggest, biggest mistake. And it's what, it's what Dave Rowe talked about on his slap stream, which is <clears throat> I don't play electric bass. I do at home. And I, and I actually, I spent a lot of time on my couch just because I like to work my left hand out. And um, sometimes I don't feel like standing up and doing this and, and, but I don't really play electric bass. So like, I kind of feel like I have a little bit of a niche with what I do, but I'd say like, if, if you don't have a niche and you're just looking to be a hireable person, I think being able to double on both is probably a good idea. So being able to play upright and electric, because I see it happen a lot. I, I see guys that one night, one night you'll see the guy on upright, and the next night, minute you'll see I'm on electric, and I'm always like, man, I, you know, maybe I should get my electric chops back up. But you know, I haven't played electric bass since I was um, 14, maybe. <laughs> so, um, what other? Let's see. I think um, I think not listening. Uh, I think not listening to the drummer, and maybe not listening to the vocal pocket or cadence whatever you want to call it i think that's something that maybe base you know and that's something i fight with a lot too it's like <clears throat> i think some some nights i just um i'm just i just don't have it and i just cannot groove with the drummer and i can't lay back enough or i'm or i'm playing two on top or or i'm stepped on the vocalist by you know i think just keeping your ears open if you're not doing that you know um you're not doing the rest of the band a service because you really i mean the bass really is you know, arguably the most important instrument in the group. I mean, you're not only you're not only keeping the time, but you're kind of the harmonic bridge. And um, so, keep your ears open and um, don't slap so much. No, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. All right, we have a question from Woody All Star. And he says, uh, I see you play a lot of closed string notes rather than open. Okay. What does that mean? Closed string notes? Like, I think, like, like you, can you hear the note? I think so. I think that's what he meant. Like that? Is that what? Woody? As opposed to, or, I, think he means, I think he means that. Okay. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> I, I, some I've kind of stumbled across, some I've kind of stumbled across over the last few years is I, 
is I like to take, like, a, a, for, for instance, like, um, okay, you take a C chord. Just say what you prefer. For, okay. <laughs> okay. I, I prefer both, actually. But I'll show you, I'll show you why I do this. Um, so I like to be able to take, like, for instance, George, a., we used this, this C pattern earlier today. Okay. So then up the board, I like to be able to play. And then. Okay, so I basically know like every every one, three, and five that's in the that's in the arpeggio, one, three, and five that's in the, the key of C. Okay, just in different spots on the board. So a lot of times. Hold, a lot of times I do it just out of. Um, I think that's what you mean by that, but um, a lot of times I do it just out of comfort on where I am on the board or just basically um, memory, you know, how I, how I kind of break the fingerboard down. So, you know, B flat, same way. A. So I think that, I think that's what you're asking. A lot of it just has to do with where my hand lands at the time versus versus the open string. It might be a, you know right. what you know you know what else it might be. It, now that I think about it, it might be a tonal thing too, because let's face it, this this G right here sounds different than an open G. And so sometimes I just maybe want a nice short note, and that might be why I do it too. But I haven't given that too much thought. All right, we have a question from Richard Trails. Is um, okay. What kind of strings do you play? What is the string height? I guess these are four questions. Uh, so if you can elaborate on all four. Okay. Do you just have a lot of strength built up in your slapping hand and fingers? <laughs> I guess. Um, I don't think I have low action. So I use, I use a. Um, I use a plain G, plain D, and a plain A gut string. And then I use a wrapped E string, um, which is also gut. And I've always, I've always preferred this setup. Um, I, used to, uh, I used to use fire cores back in the 90s. And, and then, um, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know the brand. I think maybe Lensner. Honestly, a lot of times it just is what, what's available. So... Um, so yeah, I use I use a GDA uh, plain gut, and I and I'll turn the base to the side. Maybe you can see. I don't I don't think it's super low. Um, I definitely I don't use a bump set, if that's what you're asking. Um, I did set I did have something funny happen to me a couple weeks ago though. I broke my D string on stage, <clears throat> and I reached in my bass case, and I uh, grabbed uh, what I thought was a D string. And it was a G string. <laughs> I got it up to pitch and I, and I got it up to D and I was like, wow, this thing's really like loose. And I realized what I'd done. So, but, I, but it was kind of fun for a couple of days. I, I was just able to do those really fast Kim Necroman kind of things. And, and, uh, or, or uh, the guy from New Orleans, Martin, uh, just, you know, but it just didn't, you know, across the board, it just didn't feel right. You know, I had two G strings on and, and a big fat A string. So, but uh, to answer your question, I, I I don't normally measure the height of my uh, strings. Um, I go by feel, and and you know, the longer you play, you realize, oh man, I'm having to work too hard, or I'm they're too low, and it's like you're you're digging, you can't get your hand under the string. So, you know, so I, I mean, I've I've jockeyed this bridge around a little bit. I've used the adjusters a couple of times because maybe the time of year, you know, it was the the rainy season and the whole base just changed on me or whatever. It got cold, but uh, I just, I guess I just play a lot. So that's why. I, yeah. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> George, a, I just want yeah, to yeah, say yeah, you're I'm, doing yeah, such a fantastic, fantastic job <laughs> of texting me. <laughs> And, and and talking. So I, I for anybody that doesn't know what's going on, we have like the worst connection right now. And um, I just want to say thank you so much because you're doing you're doing. 
I literally cannot hear anything he says to me. So he has to text every question to me. <clears throat> All right. What do you recommend, like, for fellow bass players, like, to uh, practice on daily bass? <clears throat> practice on a daily basis. There you go. <laughs> All right. So we had Joe for a while. I guess he's gone again, but I hope he's going to be back. Yes, he is back. Uh, Les says, I love Joe's attitude, and it's so nice to hear from a pro that my perspective on music is the way to go. Um, yeah, Joe is great, and, you know, I love his perspective. But we all have our own thing, so whatever you do, keep it going. Just try to be better. Uh, oh, okay. Swash buckler pole dots on the neck, sacrilegious. Oh, is that a quote from Two Violins? You know, since I've been doing this YouTube thing, I have all these videos popping up, you know, from Davey 504 and and Two Violence and other, I guess, music YouTubers, Rick Beato. Rick Beato might be my favorite. Um, okay, Joe came back and disappeared again. I guess we had him, like, for almost two and a half hours, about two hours straight. It was fine. So hopefully he's going to be going to be able to join us again. Yes, he's back. All right, we hear you. Tony! Yes. Hey, okay, you asked what bass players should practice? Yes. Uh, I, I, and, you and then you text me scales, etudes, things like that. I think those are all great. I think time... I think time is the most important thing. I think that the, the working with a metronome uh, can't be overstated. I, I just think that that was one thing too that I was kind of I was kind of shocked at how much I needed to work on my time when I moved to Nashville. I would I had been playing with the exact same drummer for so long that we had learned how each other felt time, but I never I was never able to play with other drummers. So when I got in situations, you know, and that happens a lot in Nashville where you get on the bandstand with somebody that you've never played with and you have to figure out how to negotiate time field and where they, where they lay, are they, do they play on top? Do, are they a behind the beat kind of player? Do they, do they, do they play with you where if you rush, they rush with you or are they, are they listening to the vocalist? And so I think that's the biggest thing I, I, other than you know like working on my soloing technique i think time feel like i'll literally just sit down with a um with a metronome work on that um you can find really there's really cool uh if you get on youtube there's really cool like you can type in like nashville train beat or you can type in shuffle or you can type in straight eight beat you know and then you can put in the beats per minute and you can practice playing along with all these and that's something especially during the, the, when the pandemic first hit and we were out of work for a long time, I was like, man, I've worked so hard to get to where I want to, and I don't want to let this go. So I, I would literally like, I would hook up a microphone to my phone and, uh, and put one of those train beats or whatever, straight beats, whatever, uh, and put it through the PA system. And then I'd play through, I'd sit there and play through my amp because I didn't want to, you know, cause it goes fast as you know, you know, it's like you don't do something for a while and it's like you get back on there two weeks later and it's like, oh, boy. So I learned to continue to play in time and to know kind of how to shift time, too. That's that's really something I think I've I've gotten a little bit better about, whereas like, you know, I play with like two or three different drummers each week and each one of those guys plays the same song different. And so you have to know how to sort of serve the singer, you know, and get 
get out of that, you know, try to play together, try not to rush, try not to drag, try to make things feel good. Um, I think that's where you'll get your job. If you're looking for a gig, I think, I know for me, I, when I hire a drummer, I, you know, the first thing I'm like, does it feel good? You know, not, can he play a bunch of, bunch of stuff? You know, that, that bunch of stuff is, is great. That's like the icing, that's the icing on the cake, but, but, but does everything feel good? You know, is, is, uh, is it getting in the way? Is it not? So I think time feels the best thing you can practice. And um, I agree with that. You know, it's, yeah, the time and pocket, it's something that creates mm -hmm. magic with music. Um, how do you warm up or do you warm up before you play play shows? And especially, I'm interested to hear how do you warm up with bass and without bass as well? How, yeah, so how do I warm up? Um, well, I used to, I used to do like, um, I would do like, um, I would take like, okay, so I, I would try to like kind of, uh, how, what did I do? I, I basically, I tried to like kind of start nice and easy. I'm, well, I'm not even plucking a note right now. I'm trying to, really, I'm trying to warm my right hand up more than anything because I know, you know, we're going to be slapping. So, but I would just try to, you know, pick the note and then maybe add the back slap in between. I'm trying to think, um, let's see. There we go. So, I'd, yeah, okay, start real simple with like a triple slap. So try to keep it all in time. Okay, so those are all like those are all like denominations of time, but the, but the but the time feel shouldn't change at all. Okay, so it's like Okay, so that's a good way to warm up because you're you're thinking about time like we talked about earlier and you're also giving your hand you're also giving your hand a good warm up the other, the other good the other thing i do too is just go back and forth on the string so start on your e string go a d g back down like this so okay and this of course is just if you're going to be slapping, I mean, there's other, you know, like I said, I don't, I don't slap all the time. So I do, I mean, just straight pizzicato. So I guess basically just as long as you can get limber and loose and, and uh, <clears throat> come out of the gate swinging, you know, especially if like uh, a lot of the gigs I play, you know, your first song kind of is like your most important song where, you know, we open up with like something like Folsom Prison every night. And it's like, you know, and then it's like, I am have to do a solo with the first song. You know, so as long as you're nice and limber and loose, you know, keep your wrists loose and and uh, have the face up at an at a, um, appropriate height, you know, something where you're not kind of having a hunch over. <clears throat> That's a great advice. I think that being relaxed is uh, the most important. Um, you know, lots of bass players, lots of upright bass players have problems with uh, with the feedback, and especially for the live, sh uh, loud shows. And you play a fair amount of loud shows. How do you fight the feedback? <clears throat> yeah, that's a that's been a big thing. When I, when I um, in the Dempsey's, I never, you know, we weren't a very loud band. My drummer was more of a jazz drummer, and and that was great because he never, he didn't, he didn't like to play loud, and and we kind of made something out of that whole thing. But when I got to Nashville, it was like, I mean, like every drummer I played with was like almost like a rock drummer, play, but playing in a country kind of in a hardcore honky tonk kind of thing. And so it was like, oh boy, I gotta really, you know, I gotta really get this thing up over, over the 
rest of the band, or at least be on level with the rest of the band. But um, <clears throat> um, what I used to do is I used to have a really high powered uh, power amp. So I'd have a ton of headroom. Um, but when I got to Nashville, um, I think the first year, I, or a couple of years, I stuffed foam in my F holes and that, that seemed to help a little bit. But I think what's been the best for me is the second sound post. Now, some guys hate it and other guys do it, but the second sound post basically goes in on, let me see here, it goes in on this side. So it's like, I don't know if you can see it, it's in there. And I just basically ordered a, or went to the hardware store and got a little dowel and cut it and just jammed it in there. And acoustically, my bass is dead. You know, it's it's not the kind of bass that you'd want to play on like a bluegrass gig where everybody plays acoustic, you know. I mean, this bass is <clears throat> probably half the volume it was without that second sound post. But with the second sound post, you're basically able to double the volume and get your notes a lot. I know, I know it sounds funny, but your notes are a lot more punchy. I don't know if that's the right word, but that's the that's the one thing I noticed is when I put that second sound post in there. And um, and you know who you know who hit me to that was I want to give him credit is Jeff Firebaugh. Jeff Firebaugh from Hillbilly Casino and he played with BR five for nine. He he told me about the second sound post. And um, I you know I was sort of like eh, I don't know if I want to try that. That seems it seems like it just does it seems like cheating or something. But you know, when you're when when you're taking this into like an electrified setting. I mean, you need you need all the help you can get, and it's no. And let's face it, it's no longer going to sound like an upright bass once you amplify it. I mean, you can get pretty close, but now you're kind of dabbling in a whole different world. And so uh, uh, Je Jeff really helped me out. He just told me about it, and I and uh, his 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 volume was just unbelievable. I mean, he's kind of like the centerpiece of that band. His bass playing and and uh, and it, and. Uh, that Tony has anyway. So I gave it a shot and I, I have not taken the second sound post out. And I think George, a, I think I actually recorded the Drake Bell album with the sound post, second sound post in. So I, I haven't gotten too many complaints on the few sessions that I've played. That's so cool. Uh, I don't know many people that, that actually record with, uh, with a second, sound post but you know i'm obviously familiar i think that jeff firebow's bass was made by jason burns uh and he was the one that you know started putting out those um two sound posts to kill the acoustics basically um since we're talking about the recordings you know how do you like to record uh, your bass what would be your choice of microphones and what would be uh your choice of of placing those microphones? Well, I, I've done it a bunch of different ways. Uh, I know when the Dempsey's recorded, um, we used um, microphones. We used the, the pickup. And then we also would go out of the pickup. Um, well, I guess, yeah, so I guess we went for the, we went to the, we used the amp. Yeah, so we would use like two, Two microphones on the bass, I think a ribbon mic, and then maybe like a something else, 57 possibly on the fingerboard, and then something separate that would pick up the um, from the pickup, and they mic maybe mic the bass amp or something. And I think I think we were trying to kind of capture <clears throat> somewhat of what I sounded like live, and I don't even I don't even really think we used much of the uh, the bass amp or the pickup. Um, um, I know when I do. When I do recording sessions, I typically we can get it done with one mic, a ribbon mic in front of the bass, usually, and maybe a second mic. But we 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 rarely use the pickup. Um, and um, yeah, I you know I think if you're a good player, and uh, you're not making a whole lot of you know you're not making a whole lot of noise on the fingerboard, extra noise I should say, I, I think I think you can get a pretty good pretty good sound out of just one one microphone but you know two's cool too with the with the fingerboard pick up the snap uh what is what is the choice for the uh amps that you that you usually play okay well i've kind of gone i kind of go believe it or not i've i my very first bass amp ever was a combo 300 pv <laughs> that was like in the early nineties. Uh, and then I got, and then I got, uh, 
you know, became a huge Lee Rocker fan. So, of course, I had to get the, the Ampeg 810 cabinet. Um, so I had that for about a year and hated dragging that thing around. As much as it sounded amazing, I, you know, it's just, it's a lot to move around. If you're not in the same place every night or you don't have a roadie, it, it, it's, a, it's a lot. But so then after that, I think um, I stuck with Ampeg amps, but I used uh, bag end speakers throughout the early 2000s till I got to Nashville. And those are really, those are great. They, they can handle a lot, but they're heavy. Um, I usually use like four tens with a tweeter. And, and uh, by the time I got to Nashville, I had come full circle and now I'm playing PV again. I, I actually, um, I bought Dave Rose old uh, PV 410 cabinet that he used uh, at Roberts with Don Kelly. And they have, they have an identical one as the stage cab as a stage uh, speaker there at Robert. So I, I have my own and it's a, uh, and it's four tens, uh, ported cabinet. And it, um, the, the, t the, the speakers have been swapped out from eight ohm speakers to four ohm speakers. So it really, it really has got a, a little bit extra bite, which is really cool. And then I use a, uh, a, a PV pro 500, which is like a parametric, it was kind of like PV's version of like the like kind of their boutique version amp that I don't think ever caught on. It came out in like, I don't know, maybe like 06 or 07. They had like this tour series. And um, and then like, it, you know, in typical fashion of a lot of these companies, they stopped making, they stopped making it. And then you're like, oh, I can't get it anymore. So then you got to go on eBay and try to find it. But no, it was, uh, it's really a cool sound. And it's, I always loved Dave's tone, especially when he was playing with the Don Kelly band. So I was like, when I got that gig, I did not want to change anything about the way the bass sounded in that band. I mean, I definitely wanted to put my own personal stamp on it, but I loved the way uh, his bass cut through the mix when he slapped and all that. So, you know, pretty much from, for the most part, I, I use a lot of the same things that Dave does. I, I use the Barbera Bridge as well, which is that pickup, that transducer, which has got, you know, let me, I'll show it to you. This is like, I don't know if you can see the bottom of this. It's got... Like they, they, you basically trace your bridge and you send it to this guy in Staten Island, New York. His name is Richard Barbera. And he builds you a new bridge with eight transducers built into the top of the bridge. So it's like if you bow, then you get to that side to side motion. And if you play pizzicato or slap, um, you get, you get that. And it's really exact. So anywhere you hit a note on the, on the board, it's like, you don't have that like, so you don't have that confusion that you might with an Underwood pickup where you're getting like two notes at once. So the combination of the Barbera pickup and the PV, the PV amp and speaker, and that's all I use. I just go straight into it. I don't use any um, preamps. Um, I use a tuner, of course, hangs out on my bridge. Um, and that's it. So you don't use any other preamps or pedals, some other effects? I I kind of got out of that. I, I you know back in, uh, back in my twenties <laughs> when I was a little bit more experimental, um, I tried some pedal and I tried like a compressor. I tried a Joe Meat compressor. It had a really cool VU meter on it and a blue light and the thing was green and you know it looked cool. But uh, sometimes I I wasn't even really sure why I was using it. I was like, is this just getting in the way? Now when you, yeah, and I used to use a wireless too. And um, once again, when I moved to Nashville, I kind of decided to like throw all those tricks and stuff out and just be like, man, if I can't go straight into the amp and get a good tone, you know, I mean, it's hard to get a good tone on upright when you just go straight into an amp. I understand that. But I guess what I was going for was I want to be able to do a lot of this with my hands, you know, um, that would always that would always bug me when I when I'd have to do a fly date, and like have another bass and another amp and not be able to make things happen you know it was like i realized then i was like well maybe you just need to practice some more you know because i i think you know i think now i'd probably be in better shape to you know get the sound that i want out of out of maybe a bass that wasn't mine if i had you know spent like five ten minutes with it or something but I, so i decided to kind of get rid of all the all the extras you know even the wireless which i mean you know, I still spin the bass, but it's like, so then I got to go back the other way, you know, to get the cord unwrapped. But, you know, 
I, I feel like I get a truer tone going going into the amp. So as much as I love wirelesses, I think it's so cool. I mean, you know, I used to run around the bar with the bass and stand on top of the bar and go out in the street and all that. But, you know, I was just kind of looking, I guess I was just looking, looking at it for, I just want to be a little bit closer to my ideals, what I'm hearing in my ear, you know. We were talking about, you know, you and you about your strings and you mentioned that um, you you break a string once in a while. How, how does that often, how often that happens? Well, I'm the absolute worst for main, like <laughs> gauging how long a string is going to take to bust. I, I, I usually can, I usually kind of be like, uh, I can look at a string and be like, nah, I can probably get another week out of this thing. Cause you know, what happens here in Nashville is the rainy season rolls in in the spring and in the fall. And even if you play inside, it's like that kind of moisture is going to come inside the club and it's going to, it's going to, going to destroy the string, but I do my best to keep them, you know, to, to keep them maintained. But, um, I, I usually order G's and D's more than I do A strings. You know, I could probably get like, if I had to say, I could probably get like six months out of an A string, but maybe maybe three to four out of a G and D. Um, and then, of course, I can probably get about 10 years out of an E string. So <laughs> I've tried other strings. I've tried, I've tried, um, let's see, there's one called, is it, it's like a gamuts or something like that. It's like a, it's like looks like gut, but it maybe it's nylon wrapped gut or something like that, and it just didn't feel the same. I, there's a couple of brands on the market where they're, they're like faux gut or whatever. It, it's like fake gut, and those are they're all great. Like when you're playing, you know, like we are here, no no amp. But anytime you get any sort of volume, I feel like a lot of those a lot of those just turn to mud, at least for me. So and I and and like I know like gut is an expensive habit and uh you know there are things like super nils and there's things like roto sounds which ro roto sounds are really cool i know jill shavashiri uses roto sounds um and i've tried to make the i've tried to make the change but i keep coming back to gut because i'm able to get the volume and and the tone of course the tones i mean there's nothing like a gut string even the guys that swear against them they know that you know if they didn't have to maintain them that they would play gut strings but but you know, um, honestly, I I love the sound of a I love the sound like what you do. I love the sound of a steel string slapped. Actually, I think there's a real you can't hide behind that. You know, I, I think especially with pitch and um, and make them you know trying to keep the rest of the bass from keep it quiet. You know, like I started out on Spiracores, Tomastics, and I played those for five years. And you know, anybody that thinks that's you know anybody that kind of gets down on those. I mean, it's, that's, that's some tough stuff there. That's not, that's not easy to do. And, and you, you pull it off and you don't see too many guys that pull it off. I've seen, seen a couple of other guys that are able to get away with it, but uh, it's, um, it's definitely a unique sound. I guess Lee Rocker uses, I guess he uses like steel strings still, right? He used to use steel strings, but he switched to guts uh, a few years ago. Uh, but he was one of the guys that was playing Tomastics and then Yarger's after that right he used um, like a solo set he did not he used regular spire course but then he switched to yarders which are different okay. different types uh a different different brand um but yeah he was using seal strings for a long time and they and i really liked his sound you know it was very powerful and it worked great for the stray cats i would say really mm -hmm. cool um kevin uses you know god strings when he plays with Dwight Teokum or like guys like that. I think that he always has one, one bass uh, strong with 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 steels. I would like to hear um, what would you say? How do you create uh, your bass lines and grooves? Do you have any particular uh, way to do that? And uh, if you can explain that. Are we back? I lost you. Yes, you are. Okay. Did you? How do I create bass lines and grooves? Yes. 
Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> with the actual like baselines, typically, I, I really like to keep things as simple as I can. Um, so I play a lot of like country music, hillbilly music, and I typically kind of break things down into either, you know, your two four bass line. Or your, your walking bass line. So with those, um, I try to keep them as simple as possible. I, I like to throw little things in every now and then, you know. That, that stuff's kind of standard Bob Moore, Junior Husky kind of stuff that you hear on those old records. Um, I think when it comes to um, you know, Dave Rowe made a good Dave Rowe. I watched the Dave Rowe one and, and, and he actually taught me this when I first got to Nashville 10 years ago, I went over to his house for a lesson and he showed me the thing where basically instead of playing, like if you're doing a hillbilly slap or a root five kind of bass line, instead of just doing the Instead of doing the alternating bass line all the time, um, you have to make sure that you're not running into the next chord. So that was the, you guys kind of touched on that, on that lesson that you took where it's like, you double up on that note, you come back to double up on that note, double up on that note, double up on that note. And so once he showed me that, I kind of realized, oh my gosh, yeah, you really have to, you have to pay attention to the chords that are coming at you. I mean, it's like, it's one thing to do an alternating root five bass line like that. But if, if, if you're, if you're pushing into the, if, if you're playing the, I guess the five of the, or the play, if you're playing the one of the next chord or you're on the five of it and you're already on it, then you're, you aren't doing your job as a bass player to sort of carve out what the harmonic function is. So I I'm really, I'm really sensitive to that because I that was such a that was such a great lesson because I played I played played bass like I played bass the wrong way I guess if you'll say um, for 15 years before I learned that trick and then I was like oh my god my head my head just exploded when he showed that to me um, so that definitely that definitely uh, helps me with my lines um, but I kind of try to stay out of the way a little bit until um, you know my solo comes around or whatever. And, and like, I guess because I do, I, I guess because I do that, people give me like, people give me more solos. You know what I mean? Like I'll do maybe two in, in a set or something like that. Whereas like one guy maybe gets one a night, you know? So it's like, it kind of becomes part of the thing. So I try not to wear out my welcome um, baseline wise by coming up with too busy of baselines or whatever. So I kind of just break things down to either two, four or four, four. You know, and it's kind of like if you think about like when jazz music first started, like so so much was two beat, you know, and then and the walking bass line came around. You know, so it's like I I think I think if you learn those two feels, you'll realize that there's stuff in between. So it's like and there's the walking. Yeah. If you do. You have like the kind of in between thing that would be like the rumba where you're not exactly walking, but you're not exactly playing uh, uh, cut time either. So I really like the the that thing that that Dave Rowe explained with uh, not going to the fifth and you know basically double up the note, uh, the root note to the last bar, so you don't confuse it with the next chord. Um, I would like to hear. Mm -hmm. What would be, by your opinion, the songs that you recorded present your slap bass technique the best? Man, I don't know. I don't know if I've captured anything recently that's really like, I mean, honestly, like what I did here today when you asked me to play, I mean, that's probably like, I would say that's probably captured what I do the best. But 
you know, do I get to do that other than downtown when I'm playing live? You know, I, I, I no, nobody really calls me <laughs> to do that on a record, but, um, <clears throat> you know, the one, the first record that the Dempsey's had out called, uh, Oh, okay. Yeah. The first, so we had a, we had a record come out in 2001 called drinking songs for your grandparents. And there was a song called back to the dog house on there kind of, you know, tongue in cheek kind of thing. And so I took, there was like, I do a couple of choruses. Then I'd take a slap bass solo on that. And at the time that I think that kind of captured what I was all about. We had a couple of other ones on there, but um, I, I think now, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of drawing a blank on it. You know, I mean, I've done some, I have definitely done some recordings, you know, I've been hired to do some things here in town, you know, where people be like, yeah, I want you to do a bass solo right there. And, and, uh, and I do it, but, um, you know, probably some of the live stuff that I've been on, like, um, Don Kelly, we had a live Dra Drake Bell, right. <laughs> I guess I, yeah, we were talking about that earlier, the Drake Bell recording bowl. And um, I guess I, we were trying to figure out what I did on that. Um, we didn't have enough time to listen to it, but George Ape could probably show me how to do it. But I, uh, I would say some of the live stuff I've done downtown probably, probably captures what I do, you know. Wow. I think that's, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you tour, uh, I mean, I don't think that you you tour that often. Um, well, I have to, at the same time to text you. Do you hear me now or I still have to text you? I guess I still have to text you. <laughs> yeah, I still text. Yeah, it's still. Um, you're still a robot. Okay. Um Oh, as long as everybody else out there can hear me, I guess we're okay, right? Yeah, I think I think it sounds great for the audience, and I can hear you, so it's it's all good. Uh, so when you tour, do you always use your own bass, or uh, right. do you sometimes um, well, rely yeah. on the backline? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. This is uh, anybody that wants to get into this racket that's new at this. Uh, definitely needs to know that the airlines have have not been friendly to us bass players i would say probably since 9 11 it, it's just gotten it's just gotten harder and harder to travel and um i think i think i what i mentioned earlier was that when you when you have to use another bass you fly somewhere and they have a rental for you and then they have rental backline and it's nothing that you've asked for um, you know, th that's, uh, that's definitely made touring harder for, for musicians. I know some guys will, if they go to Europe, they'll have like their own gear over there and they keep it over there. And that's really cool. Um, but I used to, in the nineties, when, when Dempsey's were going back and forth between Memphis and Seattle, it wasn't a problem at all to fly my base. I mean, there was a little bit of stress. So you'd walk into the airport with it and have that big giant, you know, fiberglass case and everybody, you know, you'd hear every... Everybody say, you know, make comments and <laughs> what, what, what the hell is that? But, um, you know, and that, that, that was easy. But over the years, it just got harder and harder with the airlines. Um, I, I actually, actually one time I flew out to Los Angeles to do a, a gig with the Dempsey's and we flew back. And as we were leaving L.A., I could literally see my base on the tarmac not being loaded. And we took off without it. And I'm like flagging down the, the flight attendant and I was like look <laughs> I got a gig tonight in Memphis I said the base is literally right there and you guys are pulling away from the gate and she's she figured it out she said oh it'll be on the next flight and all that but the stress of that is was just like man maybe I should just start renting bases and then of course you get into that whole thing of well you don't know what you don't know what you're going to have when you show up to the gig um, I mean I've been told I've been told by sound companies and backline companies oh sure yeah no problem we'll, a base with gut strings and and you want an ampeg or whatever it is and you get there and it's like it's not what you ordered so um fortunately in the last 10 years i i haven't had to tour too much i've been, been kind of doing the house gig thing and um but yeah when the dempsey's to, toured 
we would typically br bring our own stuff. We had a, a vehicle, but if it was like a fly date that we had to do, then yeah, we were in trouble or I was in trouble. The other guys were fine. <laughs> yeah. It's always like that. You know, we are in trouble whenever always. we have to travel. Uh, do you do anything special uh, in order to protect your base when traveling? <laughs> no way, man. Have you seen this thing? <laughs> Look at the here, the sea bow. Oh, wait, the other side. I've totally busted out the sea bow on this side. It's all like gaff taped and bonded. It's it's like, you know, I think the I think the most important thing when you're traveling, anybody that's like in a traveling band with an upright base knows the base always goes in last and on top. So <laughs> because of the bridge, you know, I, I mean that's you know, once that bridge goes down, you're, you're, it's, you know, it's not, not pretty. So, you know, every, every, every hillbilly band I know here in Nashville that travels with upright beds, it's always, you know, they put everything in first and then it goes on top, not on top of the van, but on top of all the gear. And then that's what the Dempsey's did too. We would, we would just, you know, put our, put everything in and then put the base on top. Uh, we forgot to uh, to mention uh, like some of the people that you played with, and I would like to mention um, Wanda Jackson and James Burton and Jordan Ayers and and uh, uh, Boots Randolph. Um, anyone else that you would like to mention? And please let us know how was the experience like to play with these people. Oh, that's a good question. Well, you know, when you're in a town like, when you're in a town like Nashville, you always have like, you always have like celebrities kind of popping in, you know, be like, oh, guess who's here? You know, like, like a couple of years ago, I was at Roberts and pa I was passing the tip jug like I always do. And, um, and the guys from uh, U2 were upstairs, Bono and the Edge were literally just up at the upstairs bar. They had a whole group of people around them, but it was just like, you never know. And the same with Memphis. It was like, you know, Lisa Marie Presley would always come into the club, in, into the club we were playing because, well, because she owned it, you know, and Priscilla and then uh, Jim Carrey came in there one night and um, Nicolas Cage came in there one night because I think at the time he was dating Lisa Marie. So I, I definitely, definitely had some really crazy run-ins with celebrities. Um, I kind of tend to get really shy when I'm around those people, but I think you were at, you were asking more about like people I played with um wanda jackson that was really cool we were the dempsey's were still living in seattle tacoma at the time and she um i think she, i want to say wanda jackson is kind of like i could be wrong about this it's kind of like chuck berry where it's like she she books the gig and then she gets the band from that town to back her up and 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 i, and I know chuck berry's like famous was famous for that you know like I never, I don't think he ever had like a really good band behind him because he was always using pickup bands. I think he just was like, "Hey, I'm Chuck Berry. If you don't know my stuff, then you know you don't know rock and roll." But Wanda was cool because her, uh, she was doing two nights at the Tractor Tavern in Seattle, and they had asked the Dempseys um, and a and a piano player to to pl to back her up. So we were like, we were super stoked about it, and we really took our time to learn that material. You know, like. Sometimes you, you see bands that will sort of just, you know, kind of, kind of just, um, I don't know, just like not take it serious and, and they don't, they don't really learn the songs. They just think like, oh, it's just a gig. But, you know, we were like, this is Wanda Jackson, man. This is crazy. And uh, so we learned all the songs she sent us. We learned them just like the record. We would get together like three times a week and, and not even working on our own stuff. We were working on her stuff. And, um, so she, the, the night of the first gig, she shows up like, like real early, like before the bar even opened. And she was like, she walks in, she's like, all right, you guys are my band. Okay, great. So we, we get up on stage and we play through like a bunch of her songs and she's like, wow, you guys have really done your homework. This is great. And you know, we were like, oh, like 20 years old at the time. So I don't know how good it sounded, but I think she appreciated the fact that we learned her arrangements and knew the keys and knew the intros and the outros and you know it was like what what was asked of us and she i mean i remember her like at the end of the weekend she she was she was just really pleased and then a couple of years later when we were in memphis um she was tr tr traveling through the south and came by elvis presley's memphis where we were playing and came to see us and came to say hello um i think you asked about james burton 
that would have been uh, that would have been one of uh, several of those every year being in Memphis. Like if you are in Memphis and you live there and you go to Elvis week in August every week, which is like usually like the 10th through the 16th of August, you will literally run into anybody that probably ever knew Elvis or played with Elvis. And so James Burton was always like, we'd always get kind of paired up on these shows with him. We did like three Elvis cruises that went to the Caribbean and he was on all of them. And, um, I remember him telling my guitar player, he, speaking of wireless systems, he told my guitar player, he's like, you got to get rid of that wireless, man. He's like, you don't need that, uh, which I always thought was really funny. But uh, uh, so we played with James Burton. He was super cool. I don't think we actually ever shared the stage with him. I, I think we I think we just were on the same bill with him. Um, let's see. What was the other one? Wanda Jackson, James Burton. Boots Randolph. Boots Randolph. Yeah, we were on a, uh, I, we were on that, they did a uh, rockabilly at the Ryman thing about 20 years ago. Bob, and uh, Bob Moore actually put that thing together. And uh, Kevin Smith and Dave Rowe were there. And Boots, Rand, Boots Randolph was there. Um, I did a record with Ace Cannon. That was really cool. Um, and we backed up Sanford Clark at that Rockin' at the Ryman too. The guy that sang The Fool, that was really cool. It's, a, it's such a great experience. I love playing with those you know, guys from the 50s. I played with uh, Wanda Jackson, and that was a great experience. And I played with her in, in California. She was a really cool lady. Um, so can you hear me now, or I still have to text you? I still have to text you, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, by the way, Drake just texted me and he said, uh, hello. And uh, he said, nice shirt. Hi, Drake. <laughs> awesome. Um, I haven't seen him in years. I love Drake, you know. We, you know, we usually always, we used to play a lot, a lot, a lot. And um last couple of years it's usually you know just a couple of shows per year but it's always fun and we always do christmas shows and those are those are great um i would like you to play something for the end and play you know whatever you want to play play something crazy something cool artistic whatever you feel like it do you want me to play now yes Okay. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Just once again, anybody that's joining us now, I have literally not been able to hear anything that George has had to say the whole time. It's, it's like kind of that robotic and the internet's really bad, but we have managed to do this through text message and he, you are being such a pro about this. It's amazing. Anyway, I just want to say thanks so much for that. I'll play a little bit for you here. It's starting to get dark.
Awesome, man. Like that. Awesome, man. Thanks a lot for um, being a part of the Slap Stream with Georgia live from Slapsville. I'm really happy to have you here. And I have one more question, the last one. Uh, I would like to know what inspired you to continue doing what you do after, you know, during all this crazy times that we're into in, in and, you know, it's kind of hard to be a musician. It's hard to be a bass player. It's hard to be an upright bass player, especially slab bass player. Mm -hmm. And we somehow still managed to do that. So I want to know what inspires you to do that. Did you get my question? <laughs> no. All right. We almost made it. Almost made it. And Joe disappeared. I wonder if he is going to be back. I see that he's trying. He's trying to be back. All right, Joe, you can make it. Let me read the comments. Um, all right, he's back. He's back. He's back. He can do it. We can hear you. We can see you. Hey, Joe. We can hear you and we can see you. Can you see me? Yes. 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 Okay, good. Okay, yeah. Text me that question. I'm sorry. I, I, I it kicked me off again. There we go. <laughs> um, Last question. What, what inspires you to continue doing what you do? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you, um, I think this pandemic really, you know, I, I worked so hard for so long doing kind of the same thing every night. Um, and that was great. Cause trust me, like, I, I don't, I don't let that, you know, I know how lucky I am to be making a living playing music. So, you know, a, a job's a job, but sometimes you, uh, no. I really hope he's going to be able to get back. If he's not, I would like to thank all of you. And all right, he's back. You're back. Yeah. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try one more time. Beer after this. Hey, as long as you can hear me, I'll, I'll talk. We can hear you perfectly. Okay, great. Um, well, I, what I was going to say is, I think this pandemic really, like, you know, it kind of put a stop on everything. And I mean, I think everybody probably feels this way. You kind of take stop and take stock of what's going on, and you know, what's inspired me, I guess, over the last eight or nine months is, um, you know, things like, things like this, the slap stream, like kind of stopping. And I don't, I think I've probably practiced more this year than I have in a really long time since I moved to Nashville. Like I, it kind of, it kind of, uh, watching all these different guys on your show, you know, having Kevin Smith as the first guy, that was, that was killer. That was just like, yep, this is the guy that kind of started it for a lot of us. But then, you know, seeing a lot of different stuff, guys with different styles um i don't know if i'm pronouncing his name right martin masakowski the guy from new orleans that he was that he's a really special player and um of course all all the guys ryan gould nicholas um the bluegrass guys and girls um who am i missing jimmy sutton 
a lot of guys, just a lot of guys. And a lot of, then a lot of the guys I'd never heard of, like uh, Mo Betta and um, Lucas, I think that's his name. Anyway, a lot of these guys I, I'd never heard of. And it was just, it was like, you know, like I, someone asked me earlier, how'd you get your style? It's like, well, you know, watching other guys just inspires me. So it was like, to me, that was, that's what inspires me. Is like when you run onto a new player or something, or someone that's really doing their own thing. And I saw a lot of that during this pandemic, you know, cause it, cause I had a lot more time, obviously, as we all did, as you're doing the slap stream, you know, so I tune in every, I tune in every Saturday at one o'clock central time. And um, I get inspired every Saturday. So, but yeah, man, it is, you know, nowadays I, I think with YouTube and Facebook, it's, 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 there's no reason not to get inspired. There's so many great players out there and, great podcast and interviews and um man it's if you're not getting inspired by watching that stuff uh, you might be looking at the wrong thing so thanks again and i'll see you every saturday at 1 p.m central time which is 11 o'clock uh california time thanks again for being a part of the slap stream with georgia live from slapsville and I wish to see you play live sometime soon. Uh, I know awesome. that you cannot hear me, but you are great. And I'm glad we made this happen, even with that, with a terrible internet connection. So you rule. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Appreciate you having me. I'm Thanks. Sure Sorry about you can all see this. me at all, we'll not, but time. I'm waving to you. <laughs>I hope you learned something. We talked a lot. And then you heard Joe, like, you know, he is getting inspired from all these episodes. So if you want to be good, as good as Joe Fick, uh, you should watch these episodes and definitely subscribe. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button, uh, all the, um, ring the bell and do all those, all the, everything that the other YouTubers say to do. Uh, let me see if I missed any comments that I should. Thank you, Carolyn. You're always here. Good to see you. Um, I mean, there's a lot, lots of comments. And let me finish with this one. This is awesome. Two of my favorite slab bass players in one stream. I admire you a lot. Thank you. Next, LVL. Um, oh, I forgot to answer one question. Nikki Lugoshi, he asked, Georgia, what do you think about note dots? Is, is it cheating? Or never mind. I noticed that Joe has uh, those dots, marks on the side of the fingerboard. And if you ask me, I'm not against it, but they're often wrong. The problem is that as soon as you uh, move the bridge or if you move the tailpiece or and it happens like those are not correct anymore so they're kind of useless so in case if you want to move them every time sure but like that they're like really not that helpful you know like just learn how to play bass properly just learn where all those notes are and learn where um uh, to use your ears. Um, agree with Joe. That's right. Thank you, Georgia. Stay healthy. Stay healthy as well. Greetings from Germany. Um, I guess you're right, Nikki Lugoshi. It did start, it started strange. It kind of ended strange as well, but you guys are we're still here. Uh, okay, great. Subscribe, uh, like the video, send me a comment under the video if you want me to feature somebody else. Thanks a lot for the donations. If you feel like helping out the show, check out the donations under the video. Then one PayPal and check out Patreon. Patreon has been really helping me out 
um, with putting out all these shows. And I offer a bunch of perks, even some one-on-one -on -one lessons from time to time. So um, check out the Patreon. And a huge shout out to uh, designers, especially to Niki Lugoshi this time. Uh, he did this fancy video intro and Ryan Gould has been helping out with the flyers and Fernando Slap, who did all the graphics originally and made all the templates so we can actually make this happen a little bit, a little bit easier. And um, as usual, don't forget, never fret, slide it in smooth and keep it in the groove. This is Georgia, and I'll see you next Saturday.